You hear me? That's one, too. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome us all to... Morning, everyone. I'd like to call to order the August 13th, 2024 meeting of the County Board of Supervisors. I'd like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Supervisor Koenig? Here. Friend? Here. Cummings? Here. Hernandez? Here. McPherson? Here. All right, I'd like to see if there's any member of the board who would like to dedicate today's moment of silence. Supervisor Friend. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to dedicate today's moment of silence to uh, Jim Jensen, who was a county employee, remarkable Santa Cruz County resident, um, had just a remarkable passion for trains and board games and animals, and was just one of the most creative, funny uh, people that I've met. Also, uh, very involved in local progressive causes, also state and national progressive causes. Um, I know there's a lot of county family uh, camp uh, co-workers that are really mourning his loss in the same way that I am. And I just wanted to ensure that that he was recognized for his life that was just ended much too soon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Any other board members who'd like to dedicate today's moment of silence? Yeah, Mr. Chair, I'd like to dedicate a moment of silence uh, in memory of uh, Carolyn Hyatt. Hyatt. Carolyn was a 5th District resident uh, from the city of Santa Cruz who was actively engaged in many years of the uh, arts community area. Uh, she's a wonderful philanthropist Philanthrop and volunteer and supported the Tannery Arts Center, uh, the Arts Council of Santa Cruz County, the Jewel Theater, Natural History Museum, and other organizations, including the Museum for Art and History. Um, Carolyn passed away last week after a long illness, and I, keep, I would like to have uh, us keep her uh, their family, uh, for her family, or in our thoughts. Uh, she was a wonderful person, just outgoing and very energetic. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. And I would also like to dedicate today's moment of silence to Ross Clark, who was a powerhouse in the local environmental scene who passed away suddenly on Monday, August 5th. During his career, Ross worked for the Coastal Commission as an environmental scientist, worked as the first City of Santa Cruz Climate Action Plan coordinator, and wrote their first climate action plan. Founded and directed the Central Coast Wetlands Group at Moss Landing Marine Labs and was on Santa Cruz County's Commission on the Environment for 12 years, ending his term in 2023. His term at the Central Coast Wetlands Group is part of the sea level rise vulnerability assessment that Dave Carlson and Dave Rebel are working on. He was also a husband, father, sailor, mentor, and, fr and friends of many. And so uh, with that, I'd like to um, dedicate today's moment of silence to Ross Clark, Carolyn Hyatt, and Jim Jensen. Bill, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Before we begin, I'd like to make a land acknowledgement. The land on which we gather is the unceded territory of the Waswa speaking UP tribe. The Amamutsan tribal band comprised of the descendants of indigenous people taken to Mission Santa Cruz and San Juan Batista during Spanish colonization of the Central Coast is today working hard to restore traditional stewardship practices on these lands and heal from historic trauma. Uh, with that, I'd like to um, ask the uh, county administrative officer, uh, Mr. Palacios, if there's any uh, late additions uh, or deletions from today's agenda. Uh, there are none. Okay. I'd like to see if there's any member of the board who would like to remove an item from consent to the regular agenda. Seeing none, with that, I will turn it over to public comment and um, allow any members of the public who would like to speak to the board on items that are not on the agenda, or if they would like to speak to items that are on consent or the regular agenda, you, you will have two minutes to speak on those. Um, and just want to remind folks that if you do speak to an item that's on the regular agenda at this point in time, you will not be able to speak to it when it comes on our agenda. With that, I'll turn it over to our first member of the public. You'll have two minutes. Thank you so much. My name is still James Ewing Whitman. One of the things when uh, Manu Koenig was running for office is he said that he would reestablish the three minutes. You know, it's amazing how many people are actually here wearing a T-shirt that was a business on Front Street close to Laurel. And it was um, 
very interesting problem solving. It's too bad that it's gone. But I can say that standing before all of you is a very interesting opportunity to problem solve and kind of work together and see what we can do with the information we know to possibly make some changes in our life. Now, I could have held up about nine different journals of the all the meetings I've gone to with the city and county the past five years, but we are facing some situations that are truly challenging right now. I mean, some of the situations I think that I wish would be more addressed is all the harm being done to children. And you, Zach Friend, and you, Manu Koenig, or at least two of you that I know, have young children. But yet some of the practices that you are promoting are truly harmful. Everybody can change. I'm 52 seconds. So I don't watch fake stream media that much. And I show up and watch things that older friends try to tell me are important, where in the first three minutes I can see a picture of the United States when it describes the octopus, and it's got two of the three locations on there that are major drug import businesses in the United States, and I'm talking about Hunter's Point, and then that international airport run by Bill Clinton in Arkansas. Anyway, I was watching Gutfeld. There were two professional athletes in there that were personally talking about how damaging testosterone is to men. And then they were talking about the eugenics organization Planned Parenthood that is providing testosterone to young women, women, which is nasty. So I took the time to be polite and to walk into Planned Parenthood. And they are promoting that. What are you guys going to do about it? Thank you. Hello, my name is Laura Chatham. I'm from the Mental Health Advisory Board, but the first thing I want to do is share something that is not from the Mental Health Advisory Board. It says the nation um, in the newspaper says ACLU sues city over anti-homeless laws. I just want you to see that. That's in Washington State. Other than that, now I'm going to read the beginning of the letter that is, it is second from the last letter in the agenda packet. I'm going to just read the beginning of it because that's all the time I'll have. But I will um, come back and read the rest of it with the people that didn't make it today for at home with COVID. So this is July 18th to the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors. The Santa Cruz Mental Health Advisory Board strongly recommends that the Board of Supervisors take immediate action to help our homeless population by one, directing the County Behavioral Health Department to work with the Parks and Recreation Departments throughout the county to redesign and establish a health and safety focused street cleaning encampment protocol that is trauma sensitive and follows state law requiring the storage and later retrieval of taken property for 90 days. Number two, please this decrease the cost by decreasing the number of police units at encampment cleanups. This is an issue of public health, not crimin criminal. More than three armed officers are, is unnecessary threatening and expensive. Civil California Civil Code 2080 at seek imposes mandatory statutory duties on public entities and their employees and agents. I'll continue the letter another time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the food. I'd like to I'd like to just remind folks, if you could please hold your applause, you can do spirit hands, but we want to just be respectful of people's opinions. Thank you. Hello, good morning. My name is Erica Costanzo, and I'm the Community Bridges WIC Regional Breastfeeding Liaison for Santa Cruz County and the chair of the Santa Cruz County Breastfeeding Coalition. Um, I'd like to thank the Board of Supervisors today for the presentation of the Breastfeeding Awareness Proclamation. Each year in August, in more than 170 countries, breastfeeding awareness is celebrated with World Breastfeeding Week and Breastfeeding Awareness Month to encourage breastfeeding and protect the health of infants, children, and women around the world. We are here today to help bring awareness to the importance of breastfeeding as a first step to lifelong health. Breastfeeding lays a foundation for better health outcomes for moms and their children, both in the short and long term, including the reduction in the occurrence of many illnesses and chronic conditions. 
The theme for World Breastfeeding Week 2024 is Closing the Gap, Breastfeeding Support for All. A big part of the work that we do in supporting lactation and breastfeeding families is to help create and sustain lactation accommodations in workplaces, schools, and anywhere else in the community that, community that they are needed so that families can continue to breastfeed when mothers return to work or school. It means a lot to the coalition that the board is recognizing August with this proclamation today, and our work continues throughout the year to help support lactation and educate the community on the importance of breastfeeding. Our community and businesses can also help by supporting and investing in women and their decision to breastfeed in this important effort to improve the health of all of our moms, children, and families. I'm grateful to be joined today by several other members of the WIC program and the county's public health department, all of whom are actively involved in the work of the Santa Cruz County Breastfeeding Coalition and Watsonville Community Hospital. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for all your work in our community. I'd like to invite the next speaker. Okay. Hello, Board of Supervisors. <clears throat> Thank you for the time this morning. My name is Primavera Hernandez, and I am the manager for the Children and Family Health Branch of the Public Health Division Health Services Agency. And I would like to thank you all for dedicating August as um, Breastfeeding, Chest Feeding Awareness Month. And in my remaining time, I would like to read from the proclamation. I won't get through all of it, but I want to share some important highlights from the proclamation. So... Proclaiming August 2024 as Breastfeeding Chest Feeding Awareness Month in Santa Cruz County. Whereas breastfeeding chest feeding is one of the best public health measures in providing health benefits for mothers and birthing parents, infants, families, and societies, keeping mothers and birthing parents healthier throughout their lives and saving the lives of infants. And whereas breastfeeding chest feeding provides protective factors for both the mothering parent and child and is recognized to help prevent obesity in the child, and whereas human milk is more nutritionally complete than artificial milk substitute, providing children optimal brain development, an ideal foundation for early learning readiness. And whereas the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends that infants be exclusively breastfed, chest fed for six months before being introduced to complementary foods and to continue to breastfeed, chest feed for at least two years. And whereas the Santa Cruz County Breastfeeding Coalition seeks ways to promote exclusive breastfeeding, chest feeding for six months or more, increase community awareness of breastfeeding, chest feeding importance, create support for lactation accommodation in public. So thank you, Justin Cummings, Chair of the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors, by proclaiming the month of August 2024 as Breastfeeding, Chest Feeding Awareness Month in Santa Cruz County. Thank you. Good morning. This is regarding the uh, the lower replacement program that's been stated. My name is Ken Stearns. I live in Aptos near Coralitas. My house is on a hill with a steep 90-yard driveway that winds through an oak madrove forest. I blow it with a steel gas blower blow, power blower that I currently spend no more than $15 a year on gas for this blower. Now, my blower is common a common model, and there are hundreds of them in the county, minimum. Uh, the Monterey Bay Area Resources District has a landscape equipment exchange program that states that they'll pay, cover 8% of the cost for new equipment. Well, to replace my blower with a new gas blower, if I could find what would cost me about $300. I submitted a quote to the Monterey Bay Area Regional District for, from B&B Small Engine in SoCal for a BGA 86 cordless, which is apples and apples, the same thing. The cordless blower costs $279.99. But the required battery costs three hundred and seventy nine dollars and ninety nine cents, and a charger costs one hundred and seventy nine dollars and ninety nine cents for a total of nine hundred and fifteen dollars and fifty seven cents for the same unit. Now, if I get eighty percent of that from from a bard, well, that's great. They're going to give me seven hundred thirty two dollars and forty six cents for replacement. I'll pay one hundred eighty three dollars and eleven cents. This also means that sixty people with the same unit will take up all the forty four thousand dollars that's in the program. Now, if they were to give me 50% and I'd be paying $457.79, then 96 people would be using that program. There's not enough money in this program for this. 
And the thing is that I've used this electric blower and they still have high witch, high pound, high, high uh, whining noises and you still need hearing protection for them. They still blow the same number of, 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 of dust. So, you know, really, if, if they're going to run out of funding and they will, is the con going to pick up the rest of it? Or, or are people going to be stuck later on paying 100% for a brand new, brand new uh, blower? Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Dana Wagner. I am the director of the Community Bridges WIC program here in Santa Cruz County. I am here to thank the board for two proclamations that you recently approved. The first that you just heard read with uh, proclaiming August as Breastfeeding Awareness Month, and also many thanks to Supervisor Friend for putting through the proclamation to celebrate WIC's 50th anniversary uh, this year. WIC is one of the most successful public health programs in our nation with many proven uh, benefits to families. Uh, across the nation, and we're just very grateful for your support. And here in our county, the WIC program works closely with Watsonville Hospital and the county to help families to get the best start in life, like the mom and baby that you just saw here who are exclusively breastfeeding. So many, many thanks, and so many thanks to uh, Supervisor Hernandez for supporting us and coming to our event this past Friday to celebrate all the work that we do with our partners to help families get the best start in life. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Sandra Orozco. I'm a senior health educator with the CARE team, uh, a unit of the Public Health Department Health Services Agency. And I'm here to thank you all for endorsing a proclamation, supporting the success of the Homeless Persons Health Project and Public Health Division in curing 100 individuals of hepatitis C by collaborating to reduce barriers and prioritize treatment. I am joined by my colleagues, Eleko Bridgewater, Public Health Nurse, and Socorro Gutierrez, Health services manager. Uh, we would like to read the proclamation and uh, we're, we're here to thank you for endorsing this effort. Whereas chronic health hepatitis C is a viral infection that affects the liver and can potentially lead to serious liver disease and even death. And whereas hepatitis C is the most commonly spread bloodborne virus in the United States and most commonly spread through sharing drug injection equipment with an estimated 35,000 individuals nearly nearly that infected in California each year. And whereas the current epidemic of opiate and other substance use is increasing transmission of the hepatitis C virus. And what else individuals experiencing homelessness and living with hepatitis C have multiple challenges to access testing and treatment and experience health, health disparities. And um, you want to take okay. Whereas with early detection, the use of prevention equipment, medication, low barrier treatment, and a trauma-informed perspective, hepatitis C can be cured and improves individual health outcomes and decreases the community spread of hepatitis C. And whereas the Homeless Persons Health Project, including the street medicine team and public health divisions care team integrated services, have collaborated to support 100 individuals to cure their hepatitis C um, using innovative, low barrier treatment approaches. And whereas health services agency clinicians are recognized for providing hepatitis C treatment, including Marion Jordan, Wendy Leonard, Judith Kelly, Rashmi Matthew, Sharon Geringer, Jacob Ginsberg, Anakin Hansen, Catherine Henderson, Stefan Paschini, and David Wall. And whereas the street medicine team at the Homeless Persons Health Project deserves special recognition for their innovative low barrier approach to treating hepatitis C, including Jason Johnston, Lily Pham, Benjamin Ramston Stein, Almendra Garcia, Hector Borjas, Suzanne Sampson, Cassie Cheddar, Joey Cradigeni, Marie Del Rosario, Victor Yanez, Georgina Ibarra, Karina Perez Leon, Andromeda Hello, Selena Lopez, Michael O'Connor, Leo Flores, Cesar Balthazar, Michelle Morandiez, 
Maribel Gomez, Andres Galvin, Samantha Galvin, Isabel Balestros, and Austria Bauer. And would you like to? <laughs> Whereas the Public Health Care Team Integrated Services is also recognized for its work, including Sandra Orozco and Claire Masters. Again, I would like to thank Chair Justin Cummings and the rest of the board for recognizing these multidisciplinary teams' dedication and collaboration to curing hepatitis C throughout Santa Cruz County. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for all the work that you do. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ila Rocha. I'm a social worker too in, in Home Supportive Services and an SEIU 521 member. I'm here to speak on behalf of my colleagues and me. Historically, a program as essential as IHSS has been overlooked and forgotten, and the county has repeatedly failed to invest in a preventative program meant to safeguard our elderly and disabled population. Management repeatedly speaks of its plan on aging, but the long-awaited help is nowhere to be seen for exhausted and burnt out social worker twos. In the meantime, we are left to manage an increased workload laden with complex medical care cases previously handled by public health nurses, mental health cases that we have no formal education in to be able to provide a proper assessment on, existing cases that are going overdue, applications that are piling up and taking months to process, and overall increased caseloads due to an exponential growth in aging and disabled population and medical expansion. We have been struggling to function with minimal staffing due to high turnover rates and long training periods for new staff. Moreover, already exhausted social worker twos are asked to assist in training new staff. Caseloads have increased from 140, 150 to over 200 and continue to grow. Management's response is to require us to simply work faster and do more. We are the only case caring social worker twos in the county. Increased monthly quotas are extremely difficult to meet and are not adjusted when approved time off is taken, be it holidays, vacation, sick, or even intermittent leave. If one of us needs to be out on FMLA, our caseloads are left abandoned. Many work and compensated time to try to meet unrealistic job expectations. We urge management to take immediate and meaningful action to provide the support we need and correct longstanding issues, not only for the well-being of social worker twos, but for the benefit of SEIU 2015 care providers and the community we serve. We deserve and need better. Thank you. Yep. Please, again, if you could please hold your applause. My name is Leona Hevins, and I'm a public health nurse for the Human Services Department. As a public health nurse for Santa Cruz County, I make 10% less in total compensation than other California counties. I must ask why. Why is it that our county continues to pinch the staff that serve and work directly with those that we are charged to serve? Why does our CAO have a salary of 365000 130,000 more than three, three years ago. Why do we have two psychiatric medical directors, each making 380,000 a year? Why do we have two assistant county admin officers, each making 310,000 a year? Why do our psychiatrists make 400,000 a year while the average pay for a government psychiatrist is between 209 and 375,000? Why is it that the county has added dozens of upper management positions in the last few years while social workers and nursing positions remain unfilled? Why is it that the county says that in order to attract high-level candidates, they must offer only the topmost positions competitive salaries, but refuse to apply the same logic to us? These are deliberate choices. And these choices are driven by greed and a fundamental ignorance. To the Board of Supervisors, I ask that you carefully read the salary study the county withheld for months. It is an embarrassment that virtually every position is underpaid, many by significant margins. Ask yourself how it is justifiable for a chosen few to be compensated so much while the rest are not even approaching commensurate salaries. Ask yourself how you can remedy this injustice because we, we cannot serve the people of this county if we cannot hire nurses and social workers. You really ought to answer her questions. As a citizen, 
But I'm here. My name is Nina Eliza Stratton. I'm an in-home support service worker representing thousands who take care of your parents, your grandparents, your siblings, and your children. We need health care. We need a living wage. We need to be able to pay rent and buy food and be healthy. My friend Sarah, who takes care of her sister-in-law and has been for close to 15 years, is utterly dependent on the health care that uh, IHSS provides her. Uh, she is not alone. There are hundreds who fall, will fall through the cracks of our health care system if you don't intervene and allow us to keep and possibly expand our health care. Thank you. Thank you. Um, buenos días. Mi nombre es Mari Carmen Bonilla. Vengo a representar aquí el programa del HSS. Uh, pero mi experiencia como caregiver ha sido de cinco años, seis años, um, en otros trabajos. Dejé mi trabajo por venir a cuidar a mi hermano, que en paz descanse ya murió, venirme a este programa. Y es muy triste que esté devaluado bajo del programa del salario um, menos de lo mínimo. Bueno, el mínimo. Este, he estado ganando yo en mis otros trabajos al salario más de 22 la hora. Y ahorita que entré al programa de mi hermano, este es un poquito muy bajo. Entonces, es muy triste que estemos pasando y ellos necesitan mucho de la ayuda de nosotros, al igual que ustedes algún día lo van a necesitar. Es todo. Muchas gracias. Gracias. Good morning. My name is Mari Carmen Bonilla, and I'm here representing IHSS. And I want to share my experience with you. Uh, I came into IHSS uh to take care of my brother i used to do caregiving uh for a different uh company and i worked for over five years but once i moved over to ihss to take care of my brother i was uh, stunned to realize that the salary that he pays is a lot less than what i was getting and the benefits aren't the same unfortunately my brother uh, passed away and it's kind of sad to know that now that i stay here and i live here I make about minimum wage where I came from. I was making $22 an hour and I was getting uh, benefits. So I would like to see how we can improve this and get a better salary and better benefits because we all need this. Eventually, our families are going to need and even your own families are going to need this type of care and we should be compensated accordingly. <laughs> Good morning, my name is Ezra. I've been an IHSS caregiver for 10 years. Right now, our union contract is up for renewal and the county has offered a 40 cent raise along with removing our health insurance benefits. That's a pay cut. I'm here because not only is this unacceptable to IHSS workers, it will kill our clients. I have watched my clients struggle to find reliable care and I've worked many overtime hours helping fill in the gaps. That only not only leads me to burnout, but also means the county is paying a premium wage on those hours. Next month, I'll be leaving IHSS because I can't afford to work as an IHSS provider. In my job search, direct care jobs paid no less than $22 an hour, plus a comprehensive benefits package. And they would happily hire without experience because even with higher wages, they know how difficult it is to find good caregivers. This pay gap puts IHSS clients in danger. They go without care because they can't hire enough people or hire unreliable people because they have no alternatives. They've had medications and money stolen from them. They stay in abusive relationships to keep their care. They end up with life-threatening pressure wounds from going without care. If there isn't enough care available, they end up in residential programs that cost astronomically more than paying caregivers a reasonable wage and benefits package. I could go on about how low wages affect me personally, but in this economy, I think we're all wildly aware of how hard it is to get by. IHSS providers don't do this work for themselves. They do it for their clients, and the clients are ultimately who stand to lose the most when providers are not compensated adequately. The county's proposal not only jeopardizes the health and independence of our clients, for some it would be signing their death sentence. Good 
buenos días a todos los miembros del, del, este, de la Junta Directiva. Uh, mi nombre es Esquivel Figueroa, vivo en Watsonville. Tengo en el programa IHS hace tres años, cuidando a mi hija. Y yo bueno, vengo a, a decirles muchas gracias por mirar el contrato, pero en realidad los 40 centavos y remover la cobertura de salud sería desastroso para nosotros que estamos cuidando a todos los niños y para todos los demás personas que trabajan en el programa. Este, el costo de vida está por las nubes, renta, y se quitan también la, la cobertura de salud, sería todavía más desastroso. Entonces, este, por favor, les pido que reconsideren, piensen en todas las familias que estamos en IHSS, y que piensen en nosotros. Muchas gracias. Uh, good morning. Uh... Board of Supervisors, my name is Esquivel Figueroa. I live in Watsonville and I've been an IHSS caregiver for three years. I take care of my daughter who needs care. I want to thank you for the contract that you're offering, but I mean, 40 cents, an increase of 40 cents is not enough. And also you're trying to remove our healthcare coverage. That is very uh, unacceptable. It's, it's like a disaster. Imagine how can we live with that kind of increase the cost of living, the rent that we have to pay. And on top of that, you're removing our health care benefits. I ask you to please reconsider your, off your offer. Think of all of us who are here present because we cannot live with that type of salary increase and we need our health care coverage. Thank you. Gary Richard Arnold, uh, Chairman, by the way, there were no chairs out there for the folks that drive all the distances, and uh, there's no more uh, copies of the agenda. You should think of that. I'm talking about 1313 also. People don't know, and they don't teach in our high schools or schools, uh, colleges, about hogs or cow hog. It's a parallel government. It's made out of Soviets. They're called a Council of Governments is a Soviet. It was formed by Carnegie, Rockefeller, all these wealthy people. I heard Copa mention a little earlier. That's done by the Industrial Areas Foundation out of Chicago. A lot of these groups are not local. The heads of the various departments, like the county administrative officer and city managers, are trained here. And they talk about, you hear what's happening to your children in schools. Uh, this is a quote of the co-founder, Charles E. Miriam. The essence of organization is not roughness. The human system may be reconditioned through the glands, perhaps, or through the bloodstreams, or through any one of a thousand minor manipulations, uh, gradations, stimulations, etc. And they talk about the elected people here under their uh, command, uh, the feet elected council persons are quite willing to go through the motions of self-government by having them pictured with ribbon cutting and passing resolutions of every kind, while the unelected city managers enact the plans and schemes inculcated by their being at school and through the foundation finance 1313 organizations that comes from the diary of one of these founders. They're messing with your kids in school. Don't let them. They, they admit it, and they do not have the power. There's a parallel government. Attend AMBAG, which is a Soviet. Again, I just want to remind folks, if we can please hold the applause, so we can get through public comment. That'd be great. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Jamie Vermillion. I'm a registered dietitian and lactation consultant with the Community Bridges WIC program. I want to take the opportunity to thank you for your proclamation recognizing breastfeeding. Um, I've had the pleasure of working for Community Bridges for 13 years, and during that time, I became a mother. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be supported uh, by the Community Bridges WIC program with their family-friendly work policies. Your proclamation that you uh, dedicate every year to breastfeeding allows that to be possible, not just for me, but for families around the county. Um, 
It's policy such as this that allows families across the county to provide the healthiest start to their children. Uh, in this county where access to resources can be uneven and disparities in health and nutrition are all too common, breastfeeding offers every child, regardless of background, the opportunity to start life with the same nutritional foundation. So I thank you for your recognition and thank you to Felipe Hernandez for attending our event this last Friday. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Daisy Miranda. I'm currently an intern with WIC. I wanted to say thank you for celebrating and acknowledging the importance of breastfeeding and chest feeding through your proclamation. There is no better medicine for children than their mother's breast milk. I hope we can continue to work together as a community to uplift our mothers, sisters, cousins, and neighbors for keeping us healthy and saving infants' lives. I would also like to thank the hospitals for holding baby-friendly spaces for our new and continuing mothers. Again, thank you to the community as well. Thank you. Hello, uh, excuse me, um, Bruce Walker, home health care um, practitioner. I've been a home health care practitioner for 40 something odd years. I've watched the uh, field grow and grow as the years go by. And um, I had a patient tell me that um, I do what he no longer can do. He was a par he was a quadriplegic, and so I have a short list here of of um, what we do do uh, as home health care practitioners. Uh, we are nurses. We take care of bodily functions. We bathe, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we are cooks. We are gardeners. We are psychologists. We are barbers. We do grocery shopping. We pick up meds. We run errands. Um, the list can go on and on, but uh, only have so much time. Um, I, I, I feel insulted right now that home uh, health care uh, is 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 having to fight uh, to keep our health care uh, going. Uh, we fought for it. We gained it. We deserve it. We also deserve to get a uh, a living wage. Um, as as you folks look out for uh, the goodness of Santa Cruz County, we look out for the goodness of our patients. It's, it's important to us to see that they uh, get good health care, um, which is necessary for their continuing on. So they don't have to go into a nursing home. They can stay home and um, feel good about themselves. I've I've been in a nursing homes, and I've watched patients go downhill. Unfortunately, there are good nursing homes, and there are bad ones. Um, thank you. Thank you. My name is Roy Mason. I've been in Santa Cruz for uh, six years. I'm homeless. The uh, reason I wanted to speak to you is because uh, I've seen a lot of um, animosity towards homeless people since I came here and I've had friends that have died um, on the street and they, they shouldn't have died. Um, but I have a, also have uh, friends here, like the AESEIU has saved my life twice, these nurses. Um, and so I'm all for what they're saying. Um, I think that I think Santa Cruz could be a pillar of, of strength and hope for the world. And I think that we should, if it's upside down, we should turn it around. And these people here from the SEIU are all about love. And if we could, you know, start loving our neighbors and, and treating people the way Americans treat people. Uh, I mean, we don't know where the world's going or how long we got, but I think it's worth it to, you know, look into how we can, um, 
help instead of hinder or harm others and their property. Um, uh, that's all I have. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, good morning, Chair Cummings, esteemed supervisors. Uh, my name is Kristen Brown, and you know me as the mayor of Capitola and candidate for County Two, excuse me, District Two County Supervisor. But I'm here today to express my support for our HIHSS workers. With eight years of experience on the Association of Monterey Bay Area Governments, where we manage our regional growth forecast, I've seen firsthand how our region is evolving. Last year, the pre preliminary forecast results were presented to our board, showing a significant trend. Our population is aging rapidly. The number of eight residents aged 65 and older in our region is projected to grow by more than 19% by 2050, and this aging population will need more health care and service workers, and to attract and retain this talent, we must ensure they receive livable wages and benefits. Our IHSS providers play a critical role in caring for our older adults and people with disabilities, helping them live safely and with dignity in their own homes. Yet, like many in our county who are performing vital work, these dedicated caregivers are struggling to make ends meet. As a result, caregivers are forced to work multiple jobs, rely on public assistance, and face food and housing insecurities. The severe wage gap contributes to a shortage of caregivers, leaving many unauthorized care hours, excuse me, leaving many authorized care hours unused and compromising the quality of care for our most vulnerable residents. By wa raising wages and improving benefits, we can not only address the caregiver shortage, but we can also strengthen our local economy and ensure that our aging population receives the quality of care they deserve. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Francisco Rodriguez. I'm with the Monterey Bay Central Labor Council. Uh, we represent uh, about 36,000 union members affiliated uh, with about different 80 uh, unions um, across Monterey Bay, uh, Monterey County, Santa Cruz County. Um, I'm here today to uh, because two of those affiliates, SEIU 2015 and SEIU 521, are in contract negotiations uh, with you, SEIU 2015, uh, it's unacceptable that you're asking the people who care for the elderly and those with disabilities to give up their health care. That is not acceptable. We have your county workers provide and uh, the services to many of our residents and they need to have a fair contract with a living wage so that they, those residents can receive those services and your vacancies are filled. So again, we ask you to support your workers, support your caregivers, and settle a fair contract with them. Thank you. Hello, my name is Max Olkowski Letts, Chapter President of SEO 521, standing today in solidarity with SCIU 2015. In 2020, we were devastated by the global pandemic. Our county workers were on the front lines and many of us got sick, but we gave it our all trying to keep this community safe. Our bosses, they prioritized financial solvency and decided that the best way to keep you safe during the crisis was to cut their public health workforce's hours by seven and a half percent and cut our pay to boot. Other counties furloughed too, but they all put their people back to work the instant they got their federal funds. When we asked for the same relief, we were shut down. Well, now I have 22,000 members backing me up. Is it any wonder that we're demanding more respect? When Napa, San Mateo, Marin, Solano, Sonoma, Santa Clara, and Contra Costa all prioritized rebuilding their healthcare workforces with contracts that kept place with inflation in the years that followed, our bosses prioritized financial solvency and fought us for nine months to drag things out to a new contract that didn't. Well, now I have 2,000 members backing me up. Is it any wonder we're demanding raises? In 2023, our county was devastated by historic flooding. Again, county workers were sent to the front lines and we gave it our all trying to protect this community. We were rewarded with impossibly long shifts, with no fatigue rest plan implemented. In some cases, workers working well over 100 hours in a single week. Things got so bad, 
multiple workers crashed their cars on their way home from their emergency shifts due to fatigue. Now, the county's trying to roll out a 24-7 mobile emergency response unit, desperately seeking to drive down the incredible cost of emergency psychiatric hospitalization identified in the last grand jury report by being able to meet our community members experiencing a mental health crisis out in the field. It's a good plan backed by research. But when we ask for fatigue rest for our emergency workers to avoid the exhausted mistakes of 2023, we were again shut down. Well, now I have 2,000 members backing me up. Is it any wonder we're demanding rest? Thank you. I have some papers. Could I deliver that? Oh, can I give you some papers, bailiff, gentlemen, sir? Uh -huh. I brought, um, last time I brought bread. This time I brought data. Um, okay, I'm starting. My name is Kirsten Jewell. Um, ah, my thing. All right, my name is Kirsten Jewell. Nice to see you all again. I'm here once again to petition for your support and care. And also I genuinely come in a spirit of collaboration. I really wanna be a part of the solution and not part of the problem. Um, I'm a senior mental health client specialist who has worked with integrated behavioral health for the past five years, serving our county's most vulnerable citizens at HPHP and the Emmeline campus. I've also worked as a senior social worker with Santa Cruz County FCS and have dedicated a total of 10 years to our shared community as a county employee. Max brought up what we as county workers have faced in the past few years. While frontline staff has been enduring a staff shortage, furlough, increased workloads, and salaries that are not growing with the speed of inflation, personnel and county leadership have managed to decrease transparency and trust with frontline staff. We are told there is no money, and yet as frontlines remain frontline staff remain vacant, manager after manager are being hired and promoted, and millions of dollars dollars of property have been purchased. The senior mental health client specialists who have 32 vacant positions have been begging for an equitable wage to address our staff shortage crisis. We are told there is no money. During this time of debt, the director of my department was given a $20,000 a year promotion and made a senior manager. Our facilities operator was also given was given a promotion and made a manager. And clinics just created and promptly hired for another senior manager who makes $160,000 a year. Based on info from Transparent California, the Santa Cruz County management team has grown by 70% between the years of 2017 and 2022. And yet we are told by county leadership that there is no money. Personnel won't even provide a list of HSA managers saying that this info could be used for bargaining. What kind of a system works like this where the truth is hidden and questions are blatantly not answered? Where money continues to be funneled to administrative leadership who is already making over $120,000 a year, while the revenue generating service providers are left in the dark and asked to sacrifice more while making less than neighboring counties. I brought a copy of the petition that 300 uh, HSA employees have signed. I wrote it and I would like to get a response from, from people, please. Thank you. Yeah. Good morning, supervisors. My name is Diana Verastica. I am a benefits representative in HSD. And as you know, we are currently in bargaining sessions and would like to inform you of our bargaining principles so that we can um, get your support. We're focusing on three things, the three R's, race, rest, and respect. Race, to address the vacancy crisis devastating county services throughout fair pay. Provide a cost of living adjustment, ensuring wages are not devalued by the spiraling high cost of living in Santa Cruz County, where the median rent is 2600 No takeaways to health care or other negotiated benefits. Prioritize market adjustments to ensure a competitive workforce in agencies experiencing unprecedented vacancy rates and turnover increases. Provide on-call compensation time for workers sacrificing on-call callouts and raising sharply risking our community safety and ability to grapple with disasters and weather events. Fix our broken bilingual pay system by expanding languages for which the county will compensate workers. Most importantly, rest lead as the first public agency in California to win a 32 hour work week, a 40 hour pay, improving way to increase productivity and reduce staff burnout, allowing county workers to reclaim their personal life, address dangerous fatigue for on call essential duty and disaster service workers throughout a fatigue allowance, which prevents late night call outs from becoming a tiresome and dangerous extension to a worker's workday. 
protect and expand the retirement system that guarantees rest after decades of work. As the tax on retirement occurs, we must prevent any challenges and expand our benefits that have not improved in 14 years. Finally, respect. Strengthen our workers' commitment committees by creating consequences for county's lack of follow through, rein in location transfers, arbitrary schedule changes and other methods to county uses and punish the county uses as punishment for workers. Create a hiring transfer system that respects employee seniority and provide a pathway to permanency for extra help workers Thank and you. expand the rights afforded to temporary Hi, my name is Roxana Malonado, and I'm here to speak about the Human Services Department. Um, they present an outward appearance that they care about their workforce, but the reality is different. Leadership is a facade. Um, Connie, who should be one of my coworkers, had a dream job as a benefit representative, benefit representative trainee, and it was a chance for her to build a career and to provide for her growing family. She started induction training in August 7th of 2024, um, and she described it as challenging but doable for the long run. In December of 2024, she went out on parental leave. And unfortunately, like so many women who give birth, there was complications. Her doctor provided her with a note extending her leave to figure out pop proper medical care um, and support for Connie to be able to return to work. And in April of 2024, she communicated that with the county personnel. The benefits department and personnel failed to communicate with Connie's program manager about her leave status and the disparity Disparaging manner, in the disparaging manner, Connie received a call from her program manager who demanded that she return to work because this leave is getting out of hand. Even with her medical condition, Connie persevered, arranged a daycare plan for her newborn, and returned to work. April through July of 2024, she returned to work with no accommodations despite having a doctor's note, and there was no plan for Connie um, to get retrained, even though she missed months. The county's unrealistic expectations included that Connie should have kept up all the information she learned before going on leave, and she was expected to pick up where she left off after being on leave for four months. She tried her best, and the union stewards challenged the, de the decision um, and asked personnel to extend Connie's probationary period so she could be kept up to date to ensure she had the opportunity to reacclimate, but they said no. She's not going to be coming back. This fight is critical because as a human services department, we should be able to support the women who work here. Enough is enough. Women's rights are human rights. Thank you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Hi, my name is my name is Dr. Allison Weinstein. I've been working for Children's Behavioral Health as a clinical psychologist for, me, for more than eight years. In the last eight years that I've lived in Santa Cruz County, my rent has doubled. I'm a single mom with an advanced degree and I'm barely scraping by on my county salary. When I started here at Children's Behavioral Health, there were two other psychologists by my side. In the past years, they have left and those two positions have been unfilled. County employees, including myself, a person with advanced degrees, cannot support themselves on the salary that the county offers. Santa Cruz salaries are not in line with other counties, even though housing prices in this county are the highest in the country. If I were to get a job in Santa Clara County today, I could make 30000 more than I am making here. Maybe you are asking then why not leave. I love working at CBH. I love my colleague. Sorry. <laughs> um. I love my colleagues and I love the population I work with. I would be, I, it would be a huge loss for me and the county if I left. <clears throat> sorry. My specialty is dialectical behavior. Blah, sorry. My specialty is dialectical behavior therapy. Dialectical behavior therapy is an evidence based psychotherapy that began with efforts to treat personality disorders and interpersonal complex. Evidence suggests that DBT can be useful in treating mood disorders and suicidal ideation, as well as for changing behavioral patterns such as self-harm and substance use. At CBH, I work with 
With youth who are at high risk for suicide, self-harming behavior, many of these youth have multiple psychiatric hospitalizations before they began working with me. After working with me, none of them returned to the hospital. My work has saved the county hundreds of thousands of dollars over the eight years I've been working here. All we are asking is to be co compensated as well as our sister counties for the amazing services we provide for this county so that we can continue to work and serve our community. Thank you. My name is Gabriel Barraza. I'm a proud member of SEIU Local 521 and stand in solidarity with Local 2015. I have been a senior social worker with Santa Cruz County Adult Protective Services for 11 years. I work with some of the finest, most dedicated people doing difficult but important public safety work. Our work volume has increased exponentially while our staffing has not. Positions have been held open as management plays with our budget, which has caused overload and incredible stress because we will not tolerate delays in service to our vulnerable clients. The decisions we make every day mean the difference between life and death for some of our clients. We try to keep people out of the hospital and off of the streets. We cannot do this effectively without more qualified staff. Yesterday, my wife joined the county in the behavioral health division. Helping people has been a calling for both of us. I have to say, however, that the decision for her to join the county was a very difficult one. She took a significant cut in her compensation and living in this area, even with the work of two professionals, is difficult. Santa Cruz County is the most expensive place to live in the nation. We are lucky to have been able to afford to buy a home, but we have struggled to maintain that security. Senior social workers in the county receive almost 6% less in compensation than comparable positions in surrounding counties. My wife, as a mental health client specialist, receives over 3% less for the same position. We can barely survive in this county with the compensation that we receive, and we are responsible for making determinations about people's health and safety. Everyone in this room wearing purple, represented by SEIU, works providing vital services to the county and its various communities. All of us are responsible in some way for the health and safety of the people in our community. We are overworked and stressed out so that management can save a few dollars. We are putting people's health and safety at risk for management's bottom line. We are only asking what we need to be able to live and thrive in the community as we provide vital services. Please show your good leadership and support our just and equitable demands. Thank you. Good morning, Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors. Well, here I am again. My name is Kevin Cisneros and I spoke back here in October as the only licensed staff on the MERT team. As a member of the MERT team, it's our duty to assess imminent danger for people who are in a mental health crisis. For example, if your child was suicidal, it's our duty to assess the validity and safety of their thoughts and decide if home is safe or to send your child to a psychiatric hospital on an involuntary hold. Think about that. One licensed mental health clinician in the county crisis program. It's like having a heart attack knowing there's one available cardiologist in the county. Crisis workers are constantly faced with making life and death decisions and working in this high stress environment is draining, which makes the time to rest and recover so valuable for all behavioral health workers. Our stress not only affects us as individuals, but also there's those we care about, such as family who must deal with us and our lack of sleep and patience. The county and management have been trying to add hours and responsibilities by making us work 24 seven on call shifts, cover weekends, and change daily schedules without respect to the work we already do, barely compens compensating us and allowing us to rest and recover. My manager back in February did not say what a great asset I was being the only licensed clinician on the Merck team. He asked me to volunteer my weekends as well. As the county and management continue to disregard workers' care as they push and pile on more work and stress on us, it became clear that they did not have my best interest and the interests of the community in mind. I made the decision to take a demotion to get out of the crisis work since I realized I was burned out and I could not in good conscience make wise decisions with other people's lives in my hands. If I'd continued working in crisis, I would eventually become a risk to the public. Continuing to be stressed, burned out, overworked, and undercompensated. I hope that you support us 
with the work that we do as we look to address these things during our upcoming negotiations. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Supervisors. My name is Andrew Simone, and I work with the Mobile Emergency Response Team, MERT for short. I stand before you today with a deep sense of urgency and reflection as I honor the memory of Madison Middleton, a young life lost tragically, partly because our mental health system failed someone in desperate need. Adrian Gonzalez, the young man involved in this tragedy, suffered severe trauma throughout his life, yet instead of receiving the support he needed, he fell through the cracks of an underfunded and overstressed mental health system. This failure didn't just lead to a single tragic outcome. It exposed the dangerous shortcomings of the system meant to protect our community. The grand jury report didn't just highlight problems. It laid bare a crisis. Mental health workers in Santa Cruz County are understaffed, overworked, and underpaid. With 30% of positions unfilled, we are stretched to our limits, leaving significant gaps in the care we provide. The remaining staff are overwhelmed, leading to burnout and inevitably a decline in the quality of services that our community members receive. This is more than just a challenge. It is a dereliction of duty on part of the county behavioral health and leadership. Leadership. My co colleagues and I, alongside our union representatives, have been fighting tirelessly to bring these issues to light and to seek fair treatment. But instead of partnership, we have faced stonewalling, deception, and tactics meant to undermine our worth and our work. A recent example of this is the salary study that was deliberately withheld until we took collective action to demand its release. This kind of behavior isn't just disrespectful, it's disgraceful and demonstrates a lack of integrity that has no place in public service. As the population of Santa Cruz County continues to grow, so too does the need for effective mental health services. We are witnessing unprecedented levels of anxiety and depression, and the difficulty in accessing care has never been greater. We are ready and willing to meet this challenge, but we cannot do so without the support and fair compensation we deserve. The people of this county deserve better, and it's time for leadership to step up and ensure that we can deliver the quality of care that every resident deserves. Thank you for your attention and commitment to this critical issue. Good morning, Supervisors. Uh, my name is Teresa Rogerson, Chief Stewart for uh, SEIU 521 County Chapter, and I'm going to read on behalf of one of our union sisters, uh, Neera Batnagar. She's a Supervising Mental Health Client Specialist and an LCSW. Dear Board, as a single mother living in the most expensive rental market in the country, I know firsthand the challenges of balancing personal and professional responsibilities. For the past 24 years, I've dedicated my career working with children, youth, and families to serving our county, demonstrating loyalty and commitment to our community and to the most vulnerable populations. Yet, despite this dedication, I find myself struggling to make ends meet as the cost of living continues to rise without adequate adjustments to our compensation. For the first time in my career, I have looked elsewhere for more favorable compensation, reduced bureaucracy, less stress, and a place to continue to make meaningful and effective change, especially to the betterment of the youth. I envisioned retiring with the county after 33 years of dedicated service. The disparity between our salaries and the increasing cost of living is glaring. It's not just about keeping up with rent or utilities, it's about ensuring that we can provide for our families while still giving the best at work. This is why we urgently need parity and a significant cost of living adjustment to reflect the realities we face every day. Moreover, our department is facing a critical staffing crisis. Not only are vacant positions on pause, but we are also unable to recruit and hire enough staff to fill the numerous vacancies, resulting in overwhelming caseloads and responsibilities for those of us who remain. This not only affects our well-being, but also severely impacts the quality of services we provide to children, youth, and families. The needs of the children receiving mental health services have increased dramatically, yet our resources and support, quite frankly, are not only stagnant, but have gone backwards. We're at a breaking point. Without immediate action to address these issues, we risk compromising the mental health and future of the children and families we serve. It's time for our efforts and sacrifices to be recognized with fair, equitable compensation and adequate staffing. Together, we can ensure a brighter, more stable future for our community and ourselves. Invest in your workforce. Thank you so much. Good morning, supervisors. Thanks for your service to our community. I'm Jeffrey Arlt. I'm here as a member of the Mental Health Advisory Board and showing support for two letters that we have in the consent agenda. One is the street cleaning encampment protocol improvements. The other is a letter a recommendation that the Board of Supervisors um, send letters or contact our congressional representatives to actively support 
and or co-sponsor H.R. 8575, the Michelle Alyssa Go Act, which expands the Medicaid program's reimbursement to institutions for mental diseases, otherwise known as IMDs, from 16 beds to 36 beds, and also um, to uh, provide services for individuals who are 22 to 64. Currently, Santa Cruz County has only 16 beds. The California Department of Healthcare Access and Information recommends that we have 153. We currently have over 100 individuals in our county jail being treated for mental illness, making it the largest mental institution in our county. So again, um, I ask that you engage our state, um, our federal representatives and uh, write them a letter or engage with them to co-sponsor or support H.R. 8575, allowing for this expansion from 16 to 36 beds, which would lower the cost of providing this service and those lower costs could possibly be redirected to wages. Thank you. Thank you. Excuse me. Good morning, Chair Cummins, members of the board, CAO Palacio. My name is Jim Heaney. Uh, I've spoke with many of you over the years. And, uh, you know, after 26 years here at the county, it's deja vu all over again. You know, it's just interesting how through these many years as county employee, I've been through the Great Recession. I've been through the pandemic. We've had lots of challenges. And every time, it doesn't matter what's going on, the county comes to the table and says, and I don't specifically mean you, you're not table with us, but your management team comes to the table and says, we have no money. Many years ago, I had a coworker, her name was Bonnie Palmer. She was about four foot 11. And she got up in front of the board at that time and said, I've been here 25 years and the county never has any money. How are we still open? I mean, it's just, it's, it's kind of insane that we just keep seem to be repeating and repeating and repeating the same habits. And I will tell you my history is that I was a general contractor before I came to work here. I work in the much loved planning department that, uh, you know, people love us and hate us, but we do our best to enforce the uh, regulations that are put in front of us. And we, do what we can to get people to permits so that they can actually build things and stimulate this economy. But what I wanted to share was when I came to work here, I thought adults could sit in a room and solve problems. And I will tell you that your personnel department that none of you created, but you continue to support has beaten that out of me. It's unfortunate that when we come to the table, and asked for information, which we asked for months in advance of negotiations. We didn't receive it, but they want to shut down proposals after the third meeting. Well, we're now after the fifth meeting, and we're still waiting for cost analysis and things like that. So thank you for your time. I We used to get three minutes. I missed that. Have a good day. Thank you. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Supervisor. Can, can you speak into the mic? Excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. Can you speak into the microphone? People are down. There you go. Thank you. Okay. So this is Candido Delgadillo. This is my son, Francisco Delgadillo. He is 40 years old. And he has some mental issues and mental retardation and, and other issues. And I also have a daughter who is 30 years old, she's quadriplegic, she needs care 24 hours 7. And we lose uh, every worker that we find from in support services to nursing homes because the wage is very low and the benefits that they can have uh, working in a facility are for the family, not just for the worker. And I am very sad when I hear the wages that some of the administrative people is making. The difference between that and a worker from a home support service is enormous. 
I challenge that kind of people to live with that um, with the amount of money that an income support services worker makes and see what they think if it is fair or if they need to make more. We just need to be fair. We live in one of the most powerful countries of the world and we don't have the best health services. There are other um, countries that provide better health for the citizens and they are not as powerful or rich as the United States. And I like to live here for different reasons. Freedom is one of those. But also, I think that it is fair that our workers make more money so we can get the help that we need. 24 hours 7 is a hard job. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Dora. I'm a member of the community, and we're here to read to you the strong recommendations from the Mental Health Advisory Board regarding the inhumane, ineffective, and expensive homeless encampment sweeps Santa Cruz has been doing. We urge you to take action to stop hurting our homeless neighbors. The Santa Cruz Mental Health Advisory Board strongly recommends that the Board of Supervisors take immediate action to help our homeless population by, one, directing the County Behavioral Health Department to work with the Parks and Recreation Department through the county to redesign and establish a health and safety-focused street cleaning encampment protocol that is trauma-sensitive and follows state law requiring the storage and later retrieval of taken property for 90 days. Two, decrease the decrease cost by decreasing the number of police units units at encampment cleanups. This is an issue of public health, not criminal. More than three armed officers is unnecessary, threatening, and expensive. California Civil Code 2080 imposes mandatory statutory duties on public entities and their employees and agents to maintain for a minimum of 90 days unattended property over which they have taken charge. Police departments are not storing the items taken during encampment cleanups. Police-assisted street cleaning, commonly referred to as sweeps, take place across the county. Survival equipment and valuable personal items are thrown into parks and recreation dump truck vehicles, never to be seen again. This is unlawful and unacceptable. Daily police and sheriff altercations and destruction of people's property is a self-sustaining cycle that perpetuates the harmful circumstances and trauma disorders of the homeless people. Witnesses report that the police do not listen to the homeless people's pleas for visible, specific survival items. Police can be heard threatening arrests throughout the process, making people feel criminalized and terrified. Witnesses report recently watching the police throw away a 40-pound bag of dog food as the dog owner begged to be able to take it with her. Seizure and destruction of medicine is common and can be life-threatening. Continuing on. One way to comply with the law is to not take property in the first place. This would also be cheaper. Public health goals of the camp cleanup programs are not being met. We think it can be done better, cheaper, and get closer to solving the problem. Studies of sweeps found that of the 174 camps removed by the LAPD last year, everyone has returned. The solution that is being employed is not solving the problem. The city has put fences around public parks that keep everybody out. The violent language and shock of the sweeps affect the most vulnerable in an already vulnerable population, increasing symptoms of PTSD and panic disorders. It is well documented that veterans in this population are especially likely to suffer from these conditions. The daily sweeps of Coral Street starting June 3rd were predated by a city eviction notice of only five days. With physical disabilities, even two weeks is not often not enough. Five days is horrific. Forcing disabled homeless people to move off of Coral Street is short-sighted and harmful. Many people with illness or chronic conditions will likely miss appointments and postpone care due to a much further distance to travel to access Homeless Persons Health Project, HBHP, or the Showers at Housing Matters. This ultimately can increase the severity of their conditions and keeps them unhoused and dependent on county-funded nonprofit services longer. Supporters of the police removal of the camps cite spreading diseases as a main concern. HIV, lung diseases, skin infections, as well as mental health issues afflict this demographic in higher numbers in the general population. This is why forced migration is so dangerous. Forcing people to move further away from the resources offered by HPHP can increase spread of contagious diseases and seems to be in complete opposition to the stated health concerns of the county. We need to prioritize public health. Tents, bedding, tarp, 
tarps, food, clothing, shoes, water bottles, backpacks, chargers, phones, cleaning supplies, even IDs, birth certificates, and identification papers are destroyed, making it even more impossible to seek services in the county. Some of these items are hard to acquire, and some are the most basic tools needed to get out of the survival camps and get off of assistance programs. The cycles of property seizure and destruction makes it extremely difficult for homeless people to maintain the stability required to keep in touch with the employment, with employment, family, doctors, develop routines, sleep, eat, and ultimately survive when living without shelter and everything is destroyed over and over. Recent statistics from behavioral health indicate that on average, 43% of the people they serve are unhoused, but this is likely an understatement due to the exclusion of contract services. In this county alone, we have witnessed the loss of homes to fires and floods, and we do not know when an earthquake may cause more loss. In addition, the economic downturn, especially in the local tech industries, plus the exorbitant cost of reasonable housing in this area, this should give us pause to consider that no one is immune to losing their home. About 15,000 people are becoming homeless each week in the U.S. now. We suggest that a more compassionate and sustainable plan will not only help homeless people now, would build a better infrastructure, resources, and support. This method of police action against encampments is not working. With national attention on the homeless crisis, crisis here in the Santa Cruz County, we have an opportunity to implement solutions that work. Current practices are not bringing solutions. They are exacerbating the problem. Undeniably, there is a need for safety, trash removal, and walkability all over the county. Let us all work together to navigate a new solution that prioritizes the health and advocates funding to and allocates funding to help not punish homeless people, including senior citizens and veterans. Thank you. I would like to continue by saying that in the Journal of the American Medical Association, researchers say practices such as encampment sweeps bans, move along orders, and cleanups that forcibly relocate individuals away from essential services will lead to substantial increases in overdose deaths, life-threatening infections, and hospitalizations. In coordination with the National Health Care for Homeless Council, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and the National Foundation of the CDC, a multidisciplinary group of researchers developed a simulation model projecting the long-term health effects of involuntary displacement of people experiencing homelessness who inject drugs using data from 23 U.S. cities. They use city and national level data to closely model what the population looks like in real life, including their overdose risk and mortality. They then modeled two scenarios over a 10 year time period. No continual displacement and continual involuntary displacement of this population. In hundreds of different projections, the model showed no feasible scenario in any city where continual involuntary displacement improves health outcomes. Instead, the practice would likely result in a significant increase in morbidity, mortality, and a shortened life expectancy, the study said. To continue from this study, they estimated that between 974 and 2,175 additional overdose deaths per 10,000 people experiencing homelessness at 10 years in which in scenarios in which people experiencing homelessness who inject drugs were continually involuntarily displaced compared with no displacement. Between 611 and 1,360 additional people experiencing homelessness who inject, inject drugs per 10,000 people were estimated to be hospitalized with continual involuntary displacement, and there will be an estimated 3,140 to 8,812 fewer initiations of medication for opioid use disorder per 10,000 people. Continual involuntary displacement may contribute to between 15.6% and 24.4% of additional deaths among, un among unsheltered people experiencing homelessness who inject, inject drugs over a 10-year period. Workers are in here asking why their health care services are being removed and why they are continuously told that there is no money for their basic well-being. This is where the money is going. The sheriff's budget, the sheriff's general fund contribution far exceeds that of the entire health and human services department. And that money is being spent to brutalize unhoused people and create the very crises that these workers are facing. You are spending money to traumatize 
and jeopardize the lives of unhoused people while those who are supposed to be caring for them and helping them are here begging you for health care, begging you for enough money to be able to afford housing in the county where they work. Those who are supposed to be helping unhoused people are at risk of becoming unhoused themselves and is because of how your county is spending their money. The people who are helping the unhoused are at risk of becoming unhoused themselves. I know multiple people in my life, multiple friends of mine that are working poor, that are unhoused and living on the streets and are attending a job and are trying their absolute best, but there isn't an opportunity for them to get better. And they have to face these constant, constant sweeps. In our county, in this summer, we have had multiple sweeps that last two weeks for every single day. This happened on Coral Street. This happened at the Pajaro River. This happened at the Poganip. The letter from the Mental Health Advisory Board expresses the reality that sweeps are costing lives and costing thousands of dollars. Harming our citizens on the streets puts higher pressure on our health care workers. The SEIU needs their demands met, and the sweeps must stop. The Pajaro Rising organizes with the Pajaro River residents. They have a quote from the Pajaro River resident after the sweeps, and I'd like to read it to you. I just came here when I was 20. I lived 40 years in this city. I have a family, but I just don't get along lately. So I've been here for a long time. I mean, it's cold. The nights, you know, cold. And I, the daytime, you have to look for food. It's not easy. Rather than having an apartment or a house, it's the story of living here. Life story. And the cops, they're always on you, asking for, always suspecting that you're a suspect and suspecting for this and that. You know, it's hard. They came and tore apart the little houses and whatever you have, and they don't pay mind. They just take it away and they run it over. It's basically, it's hard to live over here with the river. And it's on the same at the Poganip sweeps. We use giant caterpillar machines to tear up the public land of the Poganip and tear up the housing of the people that are trying to survive. This is completely unacceptable and it's a waste of money. Um, hello, and thank you, um, Jason and Sir and um, Manu, Zach, Justin, Felipe and Bruce for the opportunity to um, share my voice. Um, I am representing um, the Child Family Health, uh, Child Family Health Department and in particular, California Children's Services. We provide occupational and physical therapy for children birth to 21 who have very complex medical issues. I am an occupational therapist, which requires a master's degree. And I've worked hard to obtain my advanced practice in feeding and swallowing during my 20 year career. However, due to the high cost of living, um, I have thought of moving to Monterey County and working for the California Children's Services Program there. Monterey County is more affordable place to live and I would benefit from a higher salary to assist with living a better lifestyle. Um, I have worked hard in making a difference in the lives of these medically fragile children and their families. If I were to leave my position with the county, um, California Children's Services, these medically fragile, fragile children would lose their services and would be put on a waiting list. And there would no longer be a feeding therapist specialist in the county of Santa Cruz to meet their complex medical needs. <laughs> Other California children's service providers in surrounding counties are getting paid at least $10 more an hour. This is an equity issue for the occupational and physical therapist in Santa Cruz County, California Children's Services Program. Um, we do, um, yeah, an amazing public service, you know, um, as the other counties, but with less money. Um, so I'm here today to have a voice for these medically fragile children and their families that really benefit from what we provide to their children. Again, they're birth to 21. Thank you so um, much. Okay. Thank you. I am Dr. Meg Sanda. I'm one of those psychologists with Children's Behavioral Health, no longer there. Um, I had the privilege of retiring and gradually being priced out of my retirement. 
but I'm actually here to focus on all these stories you've been hearing and tell you a little story about a poor family that lived in a small wooden house and winter came and it snowed hard and the winds were rough and they had run out of fuel to stay warm. So they started taking the house apart so that they could place the wood from the house on the fire and stay warm. And piece by piece, they dismantled their own home until finally they had burned all of that wood. And then there was nothing and they froze to death. And that is what you all are doing. You are taking down your own home with the claim that you cannot buy fuel for your fire to keep this entire community going. And when you take apart your own home, all these workers who are keeping all of this going, they freeze to death, you freeze to death, the community freezes to death. I want you to think about the logic of your choices and how short-sighted they are. And keep this story in your head. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Cummings, Supervisors, and uh, CAO. My name is Jeffrey Smedberg, former Public Works employee, now proud retiree of uh, SEIU 521. What I'm hearing all the people speak before you today is there is no money for compassionate treatment of people without housing. There is no money for uh, to support uh, in a fair way the people who take care of our uh, disabled and elderly uh, citizens in the, uh, the IHSS workers in um, or members of uh, SEIU 2015. There is no money for the county workers to uh, and to fill the positions to serve our public. Where is the money going? Every day, billions of dollars of our taxpayer money is used to buy bombs to kill people in Gaza, to maim people, blow up schools and, and uh, child care centers and hospitals. I encourage your board to reconsider your call for ceasefire in Gaza that you rejected in January. Thank you. Okay, just before you speak, you'll be the last in-person speaker, and then I'd just like to see um, how many speakers do we have online? Four? Okay, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I'm Dr. Ben Ramsenstein. I'm here on my day off uh, to support uh, the SAU, which is not a union that I personally belong to, but directly affects my ability to provide care to my patients at the Homeless Persons Health Project. Um, I also want to say really quickly that I support an end to the sweeps and the responsible reformation of those and affects my patients with diabetes. They regularly get their medications thrown out. It affects my patients with heart failure. They also go without life-saving and necessary medications. And infections get worse. Every single day I keep people out of the hospital uh, in my job at HBHP and it directly affects my ability to do that when people's belongings and medications and medical equipment and bedding is being thrown out regularly into dumpsters right outside of our clinic. Um, I'm also one of the only ways that the county can make money um, other than raising taxes. I know that the clinics um, are a source of income, but I can't do that without the support staff of the nurses and the medical assistants and the social workers and everybody else that I work with. Um, and so somebody said, Kristen said, 32 on uh, open positions. Um, that's an entire department of people that could be seeing patients on a regular basis. Um, and I think it's despicable and uh, ridiculous that we're not even keeping up with our other counties right next door. Thank you for your work. Caller user one, your microphone is now available. Uh, 
caller user one, your microphone is now available. And just as a reminder, it is star six to mute or unmute. Kim, your microphone is now available. Hello. Thank you so much for about allowing me to talk. For the, for the most part, I agree with the, the folks here at SEIU that are saying all these things here. Not entirely on the uh, the sweeps. The sweeps do need to be much more professional, where they're not hurting people and throwing out poor things and and medications and things like that. They shouldn't be just sweeping these people out and just kicking them along either. They should be moved into housing, you know, or you know, into custody, whatever it is. I mean, you could turn jails or hotels or other places so they can be in a place where they're housed. Okay. But having people sleeping on the streets and all over the place in our parks and everything, no, that's not gonna work, folks. So, but I do want to say that um the the issues raised by SEIU really do affect me. You know about the difficulty with my guardianship in the state of Nevada with my mother, okay? And these are caregivers that are taking care of her. And I'm quite appalled at what I'm seeing here. So it, it's a huge issue here. Um, I just want to remind people that my mother, she worked in healthcare for five decades, okay, as a receptionist. And we all know what that is, you know, you have Rosie the Riveter there being punted out of jobs after World War II and a bunch of men coming onto the job. And, you know, it's it's a different world here. You know, folks today have more rights afforded to them. Women and children have more rights afforded to them and workers have more rights afforded to them than my mother or I as a 13 year old boy making up the economic difference. Okay, so I have the federal record at age 13. So everyone needs to think about that. So um, other than that, you know, not enough time to speak, but I am largely supportive of what the SIU people were talking about here. They should get pay raises. And by the way, their 401ks should not be raided by these e evil corporate people at companies like Transamerica. Okay. Thank you so much. Rhonda, your microphone is now available. Hi there. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Um, well, quite quite a room full of healthcare people, so I'm really glad all of you are here. I want to address the healthcare fraud that amounts to the intentional murder and homicide of millions worldwide. The Board of Supervisors opened up this discussion about another died suddenly case. And I'm horrified at how many millions of people have died worldwide since the COVID pandemic was launched. I can't count how many people I know have cancer and women who've had their breasts removed. When I looked at the contents of this medical uh, drug, it contained the SB40 40 gene, which suppresses the tumor suppressor gene. So I'm not surprised and at the same time heartbroken by all the cancer. I want to bring everyone's attention to the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit, docket number 221-CV-08688, that was opinioned and filed on June 7, 2024. It's the case of the Health Freedom Defense Fund versus Albert Kavalharo of the uh, Los Angeles United um, School District. And this case, the... Ninth Circuit concurred that COVID-19 is not a vaccine, and they cited that the CDC changed the definition of vaccine at September 21, striking the word immunity. Thus, CDC conceded COVID-19 is not a, va a traditional vaccine. So the unelected Gail Newell, health officer of Santa Cruz County, pushed this medical experimental drug, which has led to the murder and death of countless people, countless children, cancer off the charts <clears throat> and this amounts to medical murder this is health care fraud and we need to find out who ordered this homicide uh lauren Mor moray talks about the ancient bloodlines um such as come out of chicago adriana your microphone is now available Good morning, Board of Supervisors. My name is Adriana. I am the Familias Con Mas Director at Ventures. I am here to um, express our gratitude for your continuing support of our work. 
thanks to the core funding we receive, we have made significant strides with our guaranteed income project ALAS. For the 2023-24 um, year, we work with families who earn less than 65,000 and are unbanked or underbanked and from rural working class communities of different areas of Santa Cruz County. During this time, we conducted 149 one-on-one -on -one financial coaching sessions, personal financial coaching sessions, and held 16 workshops. Uh, we are pleased to report some of the major outcomes. 90% of the participants reported an increase in financial literacy. 90% experienced improvement in mental health with reduced stress and anxiety related to finances. We distribute over 90,000 to families. At least uh, all participants at least reached one financial goal starting a savings. And collectively, all participants paid off over $41,000 in debt, mark making a sustainable progress towards financial stability. Importantly, all participants are parents uh, with at least one child under 12 or 18 years of age. Participants have not only expressed immediate financial relief, but are also equipped with the tools and knowledge for sustainable long-term financial stability. While we understand that core funding does not prioritize economic mobility or financial stability, we request your consideration in supporting ways to continue to support financial mobility and economic stability. Given the increased number of climate emergencies, our families are urgently needing guidance and support to establish emergency savings. Thank you again for your support. We look forward to continuing to work together to promote equitable economic opportunities for all. Victor, your microphone is now available. Marilyn Guerra, <clears throat> bless yes. and mm -hmm. much appreciation to all the speakers today and the board should follow the direction of the speakers. Food, not bombs. Homes, not bombs. Healthcare, not bombs. Our money should be redirected, including money for so-called broadband and pharmaceutical promotion into providing genuine health care and living wages for people. Um, tonight, as somebody said, okay, I want to invite people to a talk on important health issues tonight. It's a talk by a presentation by a pediatrician and attorney, Richard B. Fox, on, uh, uh, let's see, the I don't have the flyer in front of me, on uh, removing the vaccine mandates for school children. He has a legal case that there needs to be exemptions. His name is Richard B. Fox. The meeting takes place tonight at the Aptos Grange at 6 o'clock. That's 2555 Marvesta Drive off of SoCal. And I hope people come to this because medical freedom is a human right that is being violated by these mandates of injections that are toxic for school children. That is tonight, 6 o'clock, Aptos Grange, 2555 Mar Vista Drive, which is off of SoCal Drive. Please come and broaden your understanding and action on what's going on. And thank you again to all the hard workers helping people in a genuine way. Bye. Thank you. Victor, your microphone is now available. Victor, your microphone is now available. And just as a reminder, it is star six to mute or unmute. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. 
Thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you, the Board of Supervisors in Santa Cruz County. Uh, my name is Victor Carabes. I'm a former county employee with uh, the In-Home Support Services Program. And I, I understand the need of our community, especially our, you know, uh, elderly population. I, I deal with, uh, uh, well, basically, I directly work with In-Home Support Services Program and the home care providers. And it is a great work that they do for our elderly uh, population and and people with disabilities and and children and i i i do uh um, and this call is just basically just to to uh to support and and express my uh you know the need that they 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 have in you know increasing wages they do a lot of work and it's just not not only domestic services or personal care when it comes but, but when it comes to uh medical management or taking a client to uh to a, a doctor's appointment or cleaning their their homes or just being being with them at their homes you know making sure that they are safe that's this it's critical it's it's a program that we 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 need to invest in and we need also to care for our, our home workers uh SAU 2015 um you know it's they do a lot a lot behind the scene that sometimes people do not um probably hear about but the income support services is a great program. Uh, even my mom, uh, she is now a recipient for the in-home support services program. She has a care provider and I do, you know, take my hat off for those workers out there in, in Santa Cruz, Monterey County and throughout the state of California and the nation. Um, please, uh, consider, uh, those requests and statements from workers. Um, thank you so much for your time. Drew, your microphone is now available. You guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Good morning, supervisors. I'm Drettling from Candy Landscaping out in Watsonville. We have around 140 employees. About 70% of our work is in Santa Cruz County. Uh, I wanted to talk about the gas or the bank on gas powered leaf blowers. Um, it might be a surprise to some, but we are actually in support of this ban to move to electric equipment for a few reasons. Um, it's already going to be happening on a state level, so we've been preparing for that upcoming law change anyways. Uh, most of our bigger clients and HOAs already prefer us to use electric equipment. And it all, also provides a better community perception of our industry and landscapers in general. Electric versions are generally way quieter than gas-powered ones, and at this point, the electric equipment technology is now equivalent to gas, not better, and also it has extremely less air pollution. Um, and also the right electric equipment can definitely cover any large park or HOA contract as needed. And just something to note is that it's also crucial to provide education around how to set up um, your charging station stations safely to the public in this process. And kind of like the most important final thing I wanted to touch on is that it's pretty imperative that the county and the public agencies also participate in this ban, this ban uh, just because it would be pretty unfair for private contractors and homeowners to have this ban, but not public agencies. Uh, yeah, the idea that um, public agencies who are enforcing this ban on citizens um, should be exempt goes against everything Santa Cruz County stands for. Um, we're 100% support of this ban. If the county agrees that public agencies also participating should be banned, uh, we don't want any unfair business advantage placed against any local landscaping company here, especially by the same people implementing the ban. That would be extremely unfair. If the goal of Santa Cruz County is noise reduction and pollution. Why would we stop short of that goal? We're all in on the ban. It just has to be including government agencies. Thank you. Antonia, your microphone is now available. Hi there. Uh, good morning, Chairman Cumming, Supervisor Koenig, Hernandez, McPherson, and Zach Friend. Uh, first, I'd like to echo those who spoke before me, like uh, Victor, just two callers ago, in support of raising the IHSS wages. I would like to amplify my support for those who work for IHSS, and I hope we can address these financial shortcomings. Um, so first, I want to express support for the grassroots effort represented in item number 12, regarding a ban of gas-powered leaf blowers. This ordinance is a crucial step towards creating a cleaner, quieter, and healthier environment in our community, it's my belief. Uh, I'm a volunteer board member on the Homeowners Association in a condo complex with 105 units. In that capacity, I help oversee landscaping services we hire. I'm also a remote worker, and I depend on manageable environment to do my job. 
Uh, further, the noise pollution from this antiquated machine, uh, the, uh, the gas power leaf blower, affects our daily lives. Here's my own struggle. As a systems engineer at Stanford, I work from home and have Zoom meetings that start as early as 9 a.m. I've had video presentations repeatedly disrupted by noisy leaf blowers randomly starting just five feet outside my home office window without warning. These abrupt interruptions have sometimes put my work performance into question when I had to stop a presentation because my environment here was unmanageable. Additionally, landscaping companies often ignore the noise ordinance prohibiting noisy equipment before 8 a.m. because they just want to start earlier. I've had to personally confront and hand out copies of the sound ordinance to the landscapers and to the owner of Coastal Evergreen himself. Additionally, after passage, please consider enforcing this new ordinance starting in January 2025, not waiting till summer of 2025. Furthermore, I urge the board to consider proposals for quiet gardening equipment, such as robotic electric lawnmowers. These innovative tools are environmentally friendly, affordable, and efficient. By embracing these technologies, we set an example for other regions to follow. In, conclude, in conclusion, I er encourage the board to pass the ordinance and continue to explore sustainable solutions. Thanks, gang. We have no further speakers, Chair. All right. First, I just want to start by thanking um, all the members of the public who came out and spoke today. Um, and in particular, I want to thank um, our labor groups, SEIU uh, 2015 and 521 for coming and uh, really sharing with the board their experiences um, in their workplace and in the labor negotiation process. I do want to ask um, the CAO um, when we should expect to have the contracts come back for a discussion with the board. Uh, I imagine um, we're going to come at the next closed session for an update on uh, labor negotiations. Yeah, be, that's good to hear so that we can better understand how the negotiation process is going and, and get an update on where things are at. Um, as it relates to um, some of the concerns and issues brought up around homelessness, um, one thing I do want to start by saying is that um, enforcement of homeless encampments varies depending on the different jurisdictions. And so just want to clarify that you know, there's some cities within the county um, that may address homelessness differently than the county does. And so just so that there's no confusion with what the county's role is in enforcing whether there's sweeps of encampments or trying to get people into services, that it does vary. And so I just want to encourage folks that, um, you know, to go to other jurisdictions as well and share your experiences and your feelings with them, um, just because the county and the city is different in how they approach uh, homelessness. Um, but with that being said, I did also want to just check um, with the CAO because I know that we're supposed to be getting an update on homelessness and the homelessness programs. And so I was just wondering when that should be coming to the board for a discussion. Um, I believe it's scheduled for our, one of our September meetings. Okay, so just want folks who are, um, who you know, the topic of homelessness is of interest to, that um, please keep an eye on the September agendas because that will be coming to the board and it's an opportunity for you all to get updates on kind of how we're approaching homelessness and just what's happening in the in the in that space. Um, and I think that's it in terms of comments on issues that were brought forward during. Um, public comment. And so with that, I'll bring it back to the board to see if there's any um, comments on the consent agenda. And I'll start with Supervisor Koenig. Thank you, Chair. I just also want to take a moment to acknowledge everyone who came to speak with us today. Uh, and as always, appreciate uh, the firsthand accounts of some of the challenges that you all are facing providing vital services to our community. Um, just a couple items to comment on the consent agenda. Item 35, uh, or sorry, first uh, item 25, accepting the 5300 Soquel Avenue interior demolition costs. I'm just excited to see this project move forward and want to thank Capital Projects Division, uh, the Children's Crisis Center being uh, constructed at that location will certainly help to address um, some of the needs that we heard about today. And it can't come soon enough. On item 35, taking immediate action to address the FEMA implementation of immediate needs funding and to restore the debt disaster relief fund. I want to thank the county administrative officer for his quick work putting uh, this suggested letter on our agenda. Um, immediate needs funding, which basically means FEMA's bank account is running so low they can only pay for immediate life-saving activities and will not fund permanent repairs. Um, this situation will have a significant impacts on our county 
Um, there's at least seven projects that were currently underway that are going to have to be paused uh, for this fiscal year doing um, final road repair work uh, because of the situation. And of course, more importantly, the longer uh, that we're in this predicament, um, the higher uh, interest costs will rack up as we uh, you know, ultimately look to or work to pay off the hundreds of projects that have already been done. Um, so. I don't think we can uh, say it loud enough, but Congressman Panetta and Congresswoman Lofgren, please understand that fully funding FEMA is one of the most important things you can do in Congress for Santa Cruz County. Thank you. Supervisor Friend. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll start with uh, item 24 because it's been such a long time coming on the probation work here to, on the juvenile hall gym and upgrade. Uh, it's just an important component and there's been a pretty um, consistent support from probation staff. I just think this is going to be a very important element uh, for juvenile hall. I just wanted to uh, acknowledge them and their work as well as uh, planning and others that have been working on this for so long. On item 35, um, obviously I share my colleagues' uh, comments. Previously, the board had provided extra direction. Um, I don't know if that's going to be needed again, but I, I think it also would make sense to, to have to reinstitute the work um, that I'd done to bring uh, the regional director in as well as the director have those conversations if we need that as additional direction or whether it's still allowed. But I'd like to have the authority of the board to do those outreach in order to uh, trade this up the chain quite a bit as well on that. Um, item 41 through 44, then we still have the storm damage repairs. I mean, it, it just goes to show how much work our public works team, CDI, is doing on this, um, including uh, $5 million worth of repairs for a, a street that I share, a road that I share with uh, Supervisor Hernandez, Hazel Dell. Uh, just appreciation. I know that that uh, they're still slogging through very limited FEMA reimbursements, very limited money, but um, they're still slogging through in those storm damage repairs, and so appreciation for CDI on that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, I too would like to um, acknowledge uh, the work of General Services uh, Probation and other departments who have played a role over the, uh, the years for developing plans to better, make better use of our juvenile hall uh, facility on Graham Hill Road, which is my district. And I appreciate all the work that went into this. Uh, it's been a long, long haul, and uh, we've received some grants that are going into the project. And I look forward to hearing about the success story uh, when the bids come in. Uh, also on this uh, very discouraging news that we've heard from uh, on item 35 from the Federal Emergency Management Agency, uh, I understand that situation. I mean, there's been hurricanes and uh, uh, just disasters throughout this nation, and they are literally out of money. But uh, this makes our our efforts to correct the situations of the seven disasters that have been declared in the last seven years in Santa Cruz County just that much more difficult difficult to address. Um, I, I know the FEMA is extremely underfunded. I, I know that Congressman Panetta, Lofgren, and others are working to, hard to secure the F FEMA funding. funding um, given the unprecedented uh, disasters that have ha happened throughout the United States, so uh, Congress and the administration in uh, Washington, D.C. really need to work uh, together to provide a level of support that makes these states and local governments whole in a disaster response. Um, it puts in a position that we have to respond to a crisis rather than to look ahead to do what we can do to improve the living conditions of people in Santa Cruz County. And uh, it's very discouraging, but um, I hope that uh, we can get it corrected as soon as possible. Supervisor Hernandez. Uh, first of all, you know, I'd like to acknowledge and thank everyone that did speak as well. And um, I want to thank all the members of the unions for taking time to express themselves today. Um, yeah, piggybacking on the question that uh, our chair had, if we can include the uh, salary study for, for the next uh, closed session as well with that packet, because um, I haven't had the opportunity to see it either. So if we could include that for next for the next uh, meeting. Um, Hazel Dell, you know, I'm, I'm, I get uh, calls as well for Hazel Dell on both sides of on uh, also on Zach's side, I get calls for there too. So um, thank you for doing that work, the emergency work that we got to do there in Hazel Dell. Um, with item 35, you know, I wanted to check in with uh, uh, Supervisor Koenig uh, to see if we can ask for the for them to for us to direct that letter to CSEC to see if we can take action as well um, to elevate our our voice. Uh, I'm sure there's there's many other communities 
that are facing the same circumstances um, and would be supportive as well. So if we can actually, you know, take that ex extra step. All right. And then <clears throat> let's have a few uh, comments. Um, first, just want to share um, support for uh, the Juvenile Hall Multiple Use Recreation Facility uh, Renovation and Upgrade Project. Um, it's just, I've heard a lot about this project over the years, and it's just great to see that it's finally moving forward and recently had the opportunity to visit Juvenile Hall. And so it's just really exciting to see these improvements that are going to go into that facility and make, um, you know, that space a little bit more welcoming for the people who are um, who are having to, to stay there. Um, item number 27, I uh, just wanted to um, thank and support uh, Supervisor Koenig on the composting toilet pilot project program. I know that there's been a bunch of folks over the years who have asked about this, and it's just great to see that Santa Cruz is being a leader in this space and moving this forward. So just really excited to see how that turns out. And my, my other hope, too, is that we can um, really try to do some outreach around that. Um, just to ensure that people who are interested in this program can take advantage of it so that we can, you know, understand how effective it can be for folks who are living in the unincorporated parts of our county. And then um, item number 35, I just also share the same concerns and frustration that's been expressed by our board members. Um, you know, as we've experienced um, federal disasters over the years, uh, the notion that, you know, we're not going to have the funding necessary to make repairs or after we make these repairs and we're, you know, with the understanding that we'll be reimbursed now being told that we're not going to be reimbursed really just puts us in a bad spot. Um, you know, these types of, you know, being not being able to get reimbursed for the funding that we've spent and the money that we've spent on these disasters really, you know, potentially could put us in a position where we, the county goes bankrupt or different jurisdictions go bankrupt because if we're not going to get money back, um, you know, we won't see repairs necessary. And uh, it's really concerning. So um, I think in addition to the suggestion that we maybe send a letter to CSAC, I would also recommend we send a similar letter to NACO. Uh, the National Association of Counties to the governor's office and to our state representatives, really, so that, you know, we're getting the word out to everyone how this is going to negatively impact um, our county and potentially many other counties. And and furthermore, to um, supervise a friend's request, um, I'd be supportive of um, providing supervisor friend with the authority to reach out to um, the FEMA regional director to have them come and do give a presentation. Um, Similar to what we experienced with insurance, this is another uh, really critical situation that we're being placed in. And I think it would benefit our community by having a representative from FEMA speak directly to the board and to our community. And so if that's something we could include in the motion, then I'm supportive of that as well. And so with that, I'd like to see if there's a board member who would like to um, move consent with the additional recommendations from the board. I'll, I'll move consent agenda items with the additional um, direction. I'll second, and I was speaking as broadly as possible. I'll make the invite, but I just want to make sure that they have an opportunity at a minimum to meet with the county again, as they did last time remotely, at least to talk about these issues. But I, I take the direction as, as said, but I'll. Okay. Okay. All right. With that, um, Supervisor Tony. Well, yes, I would be happy to communicate uh, you know, the urgency of this matter and our actions to CSAC as well. All right, with that, I'll turn it to the clerk for a roll call vote. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Friend? Aye. Hernandez? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Cummings? Aye. That passes unanimously. And why don't we take, we've had about two hours of uh, public comment and on this issue, so why don't we take a 10-minute break? We'll reconvene at 11.05, and then we'll begin our regular...
presentation on the 15th anniversary of Stuff the Bus campaign from Erica Cortez, I, I think student and trans project coordinator at the Santa Cruz County Office of Education. So I'd like to welcome up Erica Cortez if she's here with us. Hi, everyone. I'm, I'm on Zoom. Um, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Yes, we can hear you. Awesome. And I'm co-presenting with uh, my colleague from United Way, Amanda Gamban, today. Um, so, yeah, thank you for having us. Uh, we appreciate everybody um, uh, this time with you together. My name is Erika Cortez. I work with the Santa Cruz County Office of Education Students in Transition Program. Uh, and I'll let Amanda introduce herself. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me and Erica. Um, I am the Program and Communications Officer at the United Way of Santa Cruz County. Awesome. So just to share a little bit, uh, for, 15, for the 15th year, the Santa Cruz County Office of Education and United Way of Santa Cruz County have teamed up to support students in our community facing homelessness and other hardships. Through the Stuff the Bus Supply Drive, we provided these students with the backpacks and supplies they need to succeed. The fundraising campaign concluded with an energetic stuff -a -thon event where volunteers packed backpacks with school supplies and resource information. The backpacks, the packed backpacks were then loaded onto a school bus, which transported them back to the County Office of Education. There, the backpacks were unloaded and readied for distribution the following week. As you might know, Santa Cruz County is currently facing a severe housing crisis with rental costs contributing to significant homelessness among our residents, including students. About 11% of residents under 18 live below the poverty line. In fact, the 2024 National Low Income Housing Coalition ranked Santa Cruz County as the most expensive rental market in the nation. Additionally, the 2022-2023 annual count of homeless students in schools reported that 2,709 students in Santa Cruz County are experiencing homelessness, as defined by the McKinney-Vento Act. Despite recent progress, these students still need our ongoing support. So to address this urgent need, we set record fundraising and backpack goals this year. And I'll hand it over to Amanda. Um, and, and I just want to insert and say that we do have a, a slideshow presentation. So as we move forward, feel free to, to cl click through the series of photos. Thank you so much, Erica. As she mentioned, we set a record of fundraising um, goal where we raised over $58,000 to provide over 3,000 backpacks filled with supplies. We also received a variety of in-kind donations from the community and partners. The August 3rd Stuffathon event at the Kaiser Permanente Arena um, was supported by more than 230 volunteers who worked together to fill and um, load backpacks within a two-hour time frame. This was a family fun event, and we had volunteers of all ages, as you'll see in our slideshow. We had our United Way's Emerging Leader Circle volunteers uh, who supported with managing our assembly lines and being points of contact for volunteers that had questions. This wouldn't have been possible with our generous, generous support of our corporate sponsors. Our gold sponsors were Kaiser Permanente, Enterprise Holdings, and Lookout Santa Cruz. We also have a key Stuff the Bus team that works um, at the beginning of March up until the day of the Stuffathon, which is in August, uh, which comprises of the Santa Cruz County um, Office of Education, uh, UPS, the Santa Cruz Warriors, and our United Way of Santa Cruz County. Uh, so without this team, this all wouldn't have been possible. And at the Stuffathon, we were honored to have proclamation and recognitions from the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors, the City of Capitola, the City of Santa Cruz, the State Legislative Office, Speaker Robert Rivas, and um, Assemblymember Gail Pellerin. So we're really thankful to have everyone there uh, to support the impact that we are able to provide and also bring everyone together uh, to support students. And uh, by providing backpacks and essential school supplies, we are equipping our youngest learners with the tools they need to succeed right from the start of their educational journey. The impact of this drive really does go beyond the physical supplies. For many students receiving a brand new backpack filled with fresh supplies fosters a sense of ownership and pride. This boosts confidence and excitement about learning, helps establish a positive attitude towards school from an early age. And when students feel prepared and supported, they're more likely to engage actively in the classroom, setting the stage for academic success and lifelong learning. For many families, securing the right supplies can be a significant financial and logistical challenge. 
By alleviating this burden, the drive reduces stress for both students and their families, creating a more supportive and inclusive learning environment. This support allows families to focus more on their child's development rather than worrying about meeting basic educational needs. Within five days of the Stuffathon event, we distributed over 2,500 backpacks to local school districts and various partners, including Community Action Board, PVPSA, Walnut Avenue, Haven of Hope, Children's Behavioral Health, Monarch Services, CalWorks, Community Bridges, PV, PVSS, CASA, uh, to name a few, and some individual families as well. I'm personally grateful to witness the heartfelt gratitude from parents and students, which is always filled with genuine emotion and appreciation. Here's a message I received from a parent. Mis hijos, David y Jesse, están super contentos porque ya están listos para la escuela mañana. Muchísimas gracias por los materiales y las mochilas. Que Dios te llene de bendiciones a ti y a tu familia. In translation, my children, David and Jesse, are super happy that they are ready for school tomorrow. Thank you very much for the materials and the backpacks. May God fill you and your family with blessings. For over a decade and a half, our community has come together to make a significant difference in the lives of students facing challenges across Santa Cruz County. Since its inception, Stuff the Bus has been more than just a backpack drive. It's been a beacon of hope and support for students in need. Each year, generous contributors have enabled us to provide essential school supplies and backpacks to thousands of students. Thank you. County Board of Supervisors for your recognition and support and for inviting us to celebrate this milestone and reflect on the impact we've made together. That concludes our presentation. We appreciate your time. Thank you so much for sharing the presentation, for sharing um, the information about this event with us today. Um, I know this isn't an action item, but just want to see if there's any member of the public who would like to comment on the presentation it's here in public. Seeing none, are there any members of the public online who'd like to comment on this item? Okay, well, with that, um, I'll just see if there's any board members who'd like to make any comments at this time on this item. Just fantastic job by United Way and the sponsors, the co-sponsors. A lot of hours, a lot of dedication and heartfelt uh, effort for people delivering these to our students in Santa Cruz County. Yeah. Yeah, just thank you, Ms. Cortez, and uh, to all, everyone with United Way and who volunteered for this. I mean, our children are our future, and we need them to feel prepared for everything that's going to get thrown their way uh, by the big world. And you've done, um, it, it, this is huge, just having them start the school year off on the right foot, feeling supported uh, and excited because they've got the tools for the job. So thank you. And I'll just, um, and by just congratulating you all on years of successful events. Um, and so just want to thank the County Office of Education, United Way and our partners for all the hard work that they've done um, to really make sure that these supplies are available for students. And then also just want to, you know, thank you all for your outreach because um, many members of the community um, come out and volunteer their time to help. Um, I've been able to go to past events and it's just wonderful to see how excited everyone is to really help um, um, with this program and so uh, with that just want to thank you again for uh, for reaching out and for making yourselves available to speak to the board and our community about this work that you've done and look forward to continuing to support you in future years thank you thank you so much okay with that uh, we're going to move on to our next item um Item number eight will be the next item on our regular agenda. Hold continued public hearing to certify the benefit assessment and voting results for county service area four and take related actions. This presentation will be given by our general service department. And so I'd like to invite staff from that department up for the presentation. Uh, thank you, Supervisor uh, Board. Uh, Michael Beaton, Director of General Services. Uh, this is a continuation item uh, for the final certification of the vote for the CSA 4 Prop 218 benefit assessment. The final vote tally was 78.4 in favor with a 21.6 uh, no vote. Therefore, the recommendation today is to uh, impose, uh, adopt ordinance or adopt a resolution to impose a special benefit assessment on the property owners of CSA 4. Okay. 
I'd like to see if there's any member of the public who'd like to speak to us on this item who's here in the chambers. Seeing none, are there any members of the public who'd like to, sp to speak to this item online? Yes, we have one caller, Chair. Charlie, your microphone is now available. Thank you. I uh, just wanted to uh, express again our appreciation on behalf of Paro Dunes for uh, the work of Michael Beaton and uh, all the uh, people that have been involved in uh, making sure that this vote was successful and to the uh, fire agency for their help in uh, Cal Fire in providing information that was critically needed in order to help everybody at Paro Dunes understand what the situation was. So um, we are uh, pleased that we are at this point and we look forward to revising the budget uh, in the upcoming months to uh, bring something back to the board that reflects the new level of service that the residents have approved. Thank you. We have no further speakers, Chair. All right. Well, then with that, I'll bring it back to the board for action. Supervisor Friend. I'll make a brief comment to say that we can't understate how large of an investment this this is and that CSA, it's a significant increase that, that uh, the residents there voted to self-assess themselves on. And I, I think it's really the largest investment in uh, a district's fire service and that I can remember. Uh, thank you to Mr. Beaton as well as the work uh, by Mr. Eady and the entire team. I'll move the recommended actions. Second. All right, so we have a motion by Supervisor Friend, second by Supervisor Koenig to move the recommended actions. I'll turn it to the clerk for a roll call vote. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Friend? Aye. Hernandez? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Cummings? Aye. That passes unanimously. Thank you so much for your work on this. Uh, with that, we'll move on to item number nine, hold public hearing under the Tax Equity and Fiscal Responsibility Act for the proposed insurance of revenue bonds by the California Municipal Financing Authority in an amount not to exceed 50 million and take related actions. And I'll turn it over to Peter Detliff, uh, Principal Administrative Analyst to lead us on this presentation. Uh, good morning, Chair, members of the board. Again, I'm Peter Detliff, Principal Administrative Analyst in the County Administrative Office. The public hearing today under the Tax Equity and Fiscal Responsibility Act is to issue us um, authorize the issuance of uh, bonds in the amount not to exceed $50 million by the California Municipal Financing Authority for the benefit of Reliant Seaside LP. The uh, proceeds of the bonds will be used for the acquisition, rehabilitation, and improvement of an 84-unit multifamily housing rental project located at 1380 uh, 30th Avenue. All the existing residents will be provided uh, temporary housing while the, the units are being renovated. Uh, pursuant to the IRS code, an elected body within the territorial limits of the project must hold the hearing to allow the public comment on the proposed issuance of the bonds. Um, there is no liability to, on the, for the general fund with the issuance of these bonds. Representatives from the financing team are here today and I hopefully are still on Zoom um, to answer any questions. And it's recommended that your board open the public hearing for comment. It, with that, uh, we will go ahead and open up the public hearing. And I'd like to ask if there's any member of the public who would like to comment on this item who's here in chambers. Seeing none, I'll see if there's any member of the public online who would like to speak to this item. We have no callers online, Chair. Okay, with that, I'll close the public hearing and bring it back to the board for action and any discussion. Sure. Um, I'll just say that, you know, of course, in, in many ways, uh, this is just a uh, practice of good government, making sure that the um, uh, developer who's uh, asking to borrow the funds is uh, has a good reputation in the community. Um, sounds like that's the case as we haven't uh, certainly heard any complaints. And I know on my own research and discussions with them, it seems like um, they've done a lot of good work on affordable housing. And uh, at the end of the day, I'm just really excited to see uh, this huge amount of money uh, reinvested into what's uh, some vital affordable housing, the 84 units uh, that was mentioned at Seaside Apartments. Um, I mean, it's the, the renovations that are going to be done both internally and externally, I know, will make a big difference to the residents there. So, excited to see this move forward. And with that, I'll move the recommended actions. All right. So, we have a motion by Supervisor Koenig, seconded by Supervisor Friend, and just want to um, express my support and just, um, you know, it's exciting to see that we're going to be, um, you know, making these necessary investments in the improvements of um, multifamily, you know, low-income housing in our community. And so just really hoping we can continue to um, support these kinds of projects. Um, 
I didn't note that, uh, you know, there's a, I think there's a 55 year extension on the affordability piece and just hope that as we consider um, affordable housing in our community that we're really pushing for um, in perpetuity and the lifespan of the projects because one of the situations we have that we're seeing um, play out in the city of Santa Cruz is there's a there was a, a time limit on the affordability of, of a of a building and now that that time is up some folks are maybe for, faced with um, being evicted as the rents get increased to market rate levels and so i think that um, rather than putting these year limits on affordability we really need to start pushing for these projects to be affordable in perpetuity and so i'm happy to move forward with this today but i think that that's something we really need to take into account when we're creating affordable projects within our community so with that uh, i'll turn it to the clerk for a roll call vote supervisor koenig aye friend Aye. Hernandez? McPherson? Aye. And Cummings? Aye. That passes unanimously. Okay, with that, we'll continue on to the next item on our agenda, uh, which is item number 10. Uh, this is hold a public hearing to approve in concept a proposed in concept of proposed an ordinance of the board of supervisors the county of santa cruz adding santa cruz county code sections 13.10.494 through 13.10.497 creating a new ministerial combining district and amending table 13.10.400 to include a new ministerial combining district and take related actions and with that i'll turn it over to staff from community development and infrastructure for the presentation Thank you, Chair Cummings. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. Mark Connolly, Principal Planner from CDI with me to my right this morning is Principal Planner with Housing, Suzanne Ise. Uh, in the audience, we have Senior Planner Matthew Sunt in for support. What we have for you today is a ministerial combining district that comes from two programs in our recently adopted housing element. This uh, ministerial housing overlay would uh, be applied to certain properties in our housing element inventory and would allow for ministerial processing of future housing projects as required by state law and HCD. These parcels are included in two ways. Uh, they're either sites that are proposed for rezoning to accommodate lower income units or they're parcels that were in a site inventory that was in either one or more prior housing element cycles. Thank you. <laughs> um, just to give you a sense of where the timeline, how we got here, um, this slide shows you kind of our milestones. Staff presented to the Planning Commission um, the combining district at the May 28th Planning Commission study session and at their June 12th public hearing. The commission expressed a uh, major concern that the neighbors wouldn't be informed of future projects. So what staff has done is included a notification requirement in the ordinance to property owners and residents within 300 feet of a project site of a future project. So this is when the actual development happens on the site. Uh, the public noticing is otherwise not required for ministerial projects, and they're also exempt from CEQA. So noticing uh, the staff is proposing would direct any questions to that developer. So the uh, neighbor, somebody uh, interested would have somebody to directly go to to answer their questions and, and feel like they're heard. Um, a second piece of this to kind of inform the neighborhood is that the actual rezonings of properties by our code, uh, section 18, is considered a legislative matter, so it'll be subject to the public noticing requirements. Beyond that, staff's gonna include a lot of the social media that we do and, and really push that out to the community as well. So at the June 12th uh, Planning Commission meeting, Planning Commission made a recommendation to the board to approve the Ministerial Combining District. So this slide is just to remind us where all this comes from. This is our uh, regional housing needs allocation that comes from the state or arena as we call it. Um, the big thing is that this is showing us the units that we need to plan for for the next eight years. So that's that 4,634 unit count that you see there. And what's important to note here is that about half of these are either low or very low. 
So what we really hope is going to happen is this ministerial combining district will really help us get to uh, getting those affordable units on the ground and, and mm -hmm. built in this county. Mm -hmm. So how do we get here? So the summary uh, of this is that our state certification of the housing element requires us, our county to show that we have enough of this properly zoned property to allow development of the arena. Uh, the state determined that our inventory does not meet that arena through existing zoning and general plan designation. So we have to rezone some of these parcels to accommodate that need. So the site's inventory referenced uh, in this slide lists the 75 total parcels that we have to be rezoned and accommodate our arena shortfall. So a subset of those 28 of the 75 are also subject to these two programs. And these two programs require that the county uh, provide ministerial processing uh, as an option or streamlining for housing projects that propose at least 20% affordable units that may be proposed on these parcels after rezoning occurs. So we, we do this ministerial overlay, we rezone the par properties and then the development comes in. The two programs, uh, H-1B is the first one that applies to parcels to be rezoned to accommodate the significant number of the lower income uh, units needed to meet that arena. And then H-1C is those parcels that were included in sites inventories in prior cycles, one or more prior cycles of housing elements. So the key is that once these rezonings occur and in order to, for a project proposed in the ministerial combining district to qualify, for this ministerial processing, project has to provide either at least 20% of the total units in the project is lower income um, or lower income units. So what is ministerial processing? There's two types of processing we do or that anybody does in, in county government. Put that slide if you can. And ministerial processing is also known as by right development. You've heard that term probably. It's a streamlining of the review process. Ministerial processing is likened to um, objective standards in your zoning code, uh, general plan and other codes. An example would be an objective standard height of 28 feet. Uh, the opposite of that, discretionary review, that has some subjective uh, discretion within a decision that one makes. And that's more like uh, the building shall be consistent with the neighborhood character. So the state housing element law that's implemented through the housing element programs, H1, B, and C that I just showed you, requires that the county provide a ministerial processing pathway for the 28 parcels referred to in that slide subject to this ordinance. And as long as the projects provide at least 20% affordable housing, public hearings are not required. So CEQA expressly states that ministerial projects are not subject to CEQA, but the county did perform an EIR for the sustainability update, which did include all of the sites and areas that are proposed for rezoning. So we're really covered in terms of CEQA. And this one has all been done. Seven of the 28 parcels identified for the rezoning and ministerial combining district are in the coastal zone. Uh, and therefore subject to the Coastal Act. Um, if any qualifying housing projects are ever proposed on any of these sites, they'll be subject to the Coastal Act and will need to obtain a CDP, a Coastal Development Permit. State law precludes the county from requiring a public hearing as part of a CDP process. However, the Coastal Commission may be able to hold public hearings on such projects. Staff worked with the Coastal Commission to try to align our ministerial processing, both with what we do and the Coastal Commission. But as you know, the Coastal Commission isn't subject to these requirements. So anything that's a qualifying project that may go to hearing is still subject to a hearing pursuant to the Coastal Act. So just in summary, how do we do this? So we're creating four new sections of code in chapter 1310. So the first one is, chap, uh, is point four nine four, and that one's gonna provide the purposes. And that just really lays out um, qualifiers for multifamily housing developments uh, that are eligible for this by right or ministerial review. 495 will be the designations of the sites. 496 will lay out those uh, objective standards um, and the, really the rules that one is required to follow to get in this ministerial processing. 
And then last, uh, 497 will address how the projects are processed in the coastal zone. So where are these parcels? So here's the mid-county parcels here in purple, as you can see on the screen. Um, these are the, the parcels subject to the two programs, H1B and C. And the ones in purple on this map, uh, most of them are along major roadways in central urban areas of the unincorporated area. And it also shows the seven parcels here you see in the light blue, which is the coastal zone that uh, would be subject to this. As we look to South County, you can see they're all in a nice central area here and a lot less sites in the South County area. Um, but this is where the Ministerial Combining District would be applicable in South County. So staff received one letter from a concerned citizen, which is included in your packet. Um, and what we're looking for from the board today is I'll read the recommended action here. Um, looking for uh, the board to adopt the attached resolution recommending that the Board of Supervisors um, acknowledge the addendum to the EIR uh, that was prepared for the sustainability update. Uh, also direct staff to submit the LCP amendment to the California Coastal Commission for certification. Approve in concept the ordinance of the Board of Supervisors for the County of Santa Cruz, adding this code section of the four code sections. And direct the clerk of the board to schedule a second reading of the final adoption of the ordinance on August 27th, 2024. So with that, that wraps up our presentation and we can answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much for that presentation. Uh, I'm going to start by opening this up to the public to see if there's any members of the public who would like to speak to us on this item. Seeing none here in chambers, I'd like to ask the clerk to see if there's anyone online who'd like to speak to us on this item. Yes, Chair, we do have a caller. Gene, your microphone is now available. Here you go. Hello. We live a block away from one of the proposed ministerial parcels. Since 2016, that parcel has been through several iterations and the public has been engaged with its development. The various proposed developments died on their own without the public causing their demise, but we were allowed to be engaged. Today's staff memo, you know, mentions the one public comment was received um, and, and is included. One public comment only? I'm asking, why is that? Does that mean no one cares? You bet it does not mean no one cares. What it means is that the public has given up any hope that we can be engaged in large scale building projects that will affect our lives, our neighborhoods, our communities, our democracy. No public hearings. As the dual authors of that one letter contained in today's agenda packet put, put it succinctly, that is an outrageous end run about the public, around the public, because people will not bother to show up to attend a meeting on a proposed ministerial combining district. Well, I'm showing up today, but it won't do a bit of good, will it? Therein lies my personal frustration with a state government out of control. When and how do we as a community government fight back against this injustice? Thank you, supervisors, for hearing my frustration today. We have no further speakers, Chair. Okay. Um, maybe for the sake of Providing a little bit of clarity, I'm wondering if you could speak to kind of the timeline of how this has come about. Um, just in response to the comments we heard, I know there's a lengthy housing element process. This has gone to planning commission, but just wondering if you could just um, reiterate some of the points about the timeline and out outreach. Yes, thank you, Chair Cummings. Yeah, the the housing element itself went through a very robust outreach uh, effort and process over uh, many years. Uh, unfortunately, this ministerial treatment of these future sites is a matter of state law. We don't have any control of it, but staff did acknowledge that difficulty and we do want to do everything we can to uh, acknowledge this to the public, bring the attention to it. Uh, so we've, again, we've uh, 
done this where we've increased our notification ring. Uh, we're going to use social media to get to folks. And we really wanted to put some separate extra effort into it. So that's why the notification will include actually getting to the developers, uh, you know, their phone number, their email, put the, the person that may be concerned in direct contact with the developer to answer their questions because we don't want to get to a point where it's ministerial there's no public hearing uh, and no nobody has any way of feeling any hope of talking to somebody about their concerns so um absent that public hearing or that you know that discretionary action that really would be a gap in this so we think we've closed that gap by providing and affording for this process I may add, uh, just in terms of the timeline question, um, your board may recall we did about a year-long outreach process for the preparation of the housing element. That was uh, most of 2023. Um, a portion of this content was included throughout that outreach process, although the actual design of the program was not fully fleshed out until later in the tail end of that process. You may recall also that when we... Um, we're on the cusp of getting the state approval and certification of our draft housing element. We brought an item to your board on April 9th of this year, and we specifically focused on this being one of the details that HCD was requiring us to add. Essentially, it was a revision in part to the draft to add. We already had seven of the parcels flagged for the um, ministerial combining zone in that original draft that the board adopted in November of last year. Um, but they brought it to our attention during the course of that review that we needed it to include the 21 additional parcels because of this. It basically, there's these very complicated paragraphs in the state statute that were added around 2018 to add this newer requirement. Um, basically, it kind of beefs up the housing element laws a little bit more than they had been previously. Um, and the whole point of it is really to assure that communities can actually get housing built as opposed to just zoning for housing and then it hits a wall of opposition or what have you during discretionary review. The lawmakers who wrote those bills and got them passed were trying to attempt to make the pro process actually result in more housing on the ground. So in any event, they really focused on this one issue as part of their certification review. And we would not have been able to get certified had we not sort of fleshed it out the way that you see it now um, in our code. So we have been working on this for a very long time. We've talked about it in multiple public meetings, hearings, Zoom meetings, what have you, for quite some time. And as Mark said, um, when the actual development applications come in, we will be noticing within 300 feet of the site um, that these proposals are coming in. The other thing I just wanted to clarify in terms of the sites themselves, we've noted in the report that it's 28 parcels in total. It's not 28 sites. So some of these sites consist of two or three parcels. So it's really only about 18 to 20 sites because some of them are what we call consolidated sites. Great. Thank you very much. Any other questions or comments from board members, Supervisor Pratt? I appreciate your work on this. And I just think just from a point of clarification, while there was a lot of outreach on the housing element, this wasn't part of the early stages of the housing element, as you were emphasizing. So I recognize and respect what Ms. Brocklebank is saying is that while we discuss these parcels at length, we discuss the need for the number of, of units in RENA at length. The fact that functionally all local control would be taken away on decisions of anything over 20% in these parcels, I don't think was really actually discussed extensively in a public way. Um, and I do believe that, um, although I actually understand why the state is doing it, um, because of how difficult it's been for projects to occur throughout the state of California, um, I, I can foresee moving forward that, that a future board is going to um, receive concern from the community as to why a large scale uh, project in in one's neighborhood functionally didn't receive any any input. I mean, noticing without being able to actually functionally impact a project is is just noticing with without any, I mean, without any real meaning. So, I think that that um, I just foresee that being a, an issue that the future boards are going to have to deal with. Um, and I think it, it there wasn't because this is a state mandate. There wasn't the ability to have the same sort of input as as people felt maybe in the in the more holistic. Uh, 
housing. But that, that's, that has nothing, that's not a reflection on, on your work at all. I just wanted to make sure that, that we were kind of on the same page as to how much time was really spent on this specific element. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Supervisor Koenig. All right. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, but I think I, I agree with Supervisor Friend that the reason we're not hearing a whole lot of public input today is uh, sort of twofold. One, um, people often don't have the bandwidth to be concerned with um, you know, the nitpicky details of, of zoning policy. And I, I'm sure even just the phrasing of this, the ministerial combining district is um, over most people's heads. I mean, I barely understand it. Um, and, you know, then, of course, the, as um, Ms. Brockenbank said, that um, ultimately we don't have a whole lot of impact, ability to even impact the implementation of this law, um, of course, which is, which is going to mean that we have, uh, or uh, we, both the Board of Supervisors, the Planning Commission, and the public will have zero ability to impact these projects in the future. Um, it's sort of a, a double-edged sword. I mean, on the one hand, as the close to two hours of public comment made clear this morning, our community is facing a cost of living crisis largely driven by the cost of housing, uh, which means we are desperate for more housing. And the fact that ministerial um, review is gonna could shave months, if not years off of the timeline to build new projects um, is, is exciting. It's a good thing. It means that um, that housing we so desperately need will get uh, built, hopefully better, faster, cheaper. Um, on the other side, it's, um, but just frankly a little weird being, I think, in, in our position as supervisors not to have that opportunity to give feedback on these projects um, and not to be able to um, also bring some of the feedback we hear from the, the community to bear, um, especially because a lot of time we have specialty knowledge about, you know, whatever it is, the uh, value of an existing commercial building that's on site or other projects planned nearby. So, um, but at the end of the day, those are the orders from the state. Um, so I certainly will uh, continue conversations with other leaders in uh, our jurisdictions, mayors of uh, the this, uh, cities, um, and have those conversations with uh, our state policymakers um, as the situation evolves. And um, I'm glad that at least the design review group step is there in an order for uh, folks developing this housing to get some uh, of that local knowledge and community input. Um, and I'm also glad that the Planning Commission included the noticing requirement, um, so at least people know what's happening. Um, I have one question, just to understand this. So, so we're identifying these 28 parcels. Um, products are only available for ministerial approval or review uh, if they have that 20% lower income, um, which means, means 60% of the uh, area median income or less. Um, would other parcels that have a project that uh, with with twenty percent lower income, uh, de-restricted lower income units, be eligible to apply for the ministerial combining district to also then have um, ministerial review? Um, not the way the ordinance is currently proposed. So we've written it specifically to address our housing element requirements. So it is strictly applicable to the 28 parcels that are identified in the packet. They're a subset of the units on our rezoning list. Um, and we haven't written into the code any ability for folks to like voluntarily apply their property to be zoned into this overlay zone. Part of the reason for that is there are multiple other streamlining pathways available to a large um, swath of properties throughout the state through state law and they have similar the same requirement in a lot of cases for the 20 percent affordable um, so there are some pathways that have that requirement there are other streamlined pathways such as sb 35 that have sort of a more complicated formula for how many affordable units but you know we have folks on other sites that aren't in this district yet obviously because it's not created yet that are pursuing ministerial pathways we even have some projects that are under construction that have obtained ministerial pathways through other mechanisms and state law so we didn't really see foresee the need at this time to set up the code for this particular combining district to allow folks to opt into the district one other thing i just want to point out is that the way we've written this proposed code language 
it doesn't remove the property owner's rights to pursue a project under the base zoning. So let's say some of these sites, for example, the base zoning might be C1 or C2, maybe it's a commercial zone. We're adding the overlay, which basically gives the property owner a new option. They can pursue a housing project for this combining district, or if it's, for example, in a commercial zone, they could just do a commercial project or they could just keep their property the way they want. If they're doing anything other than the specific types of housing projects that qualify for this processing, it would still be a discretionary review or whatever review level our code locally calls for for that type of project. So it doesn't wipe out the existing zoning on these parcels, in other words. Um, so I just wanted to point that out, that they will have various options. So our expectation is that the more likely situation is that applicants that will pursue this combining district option, this ministerial process, more than likely, I would say 80 to, 80 to 100% of them are likely to be affordable housing developers that are proposing subsidized housing projects. In most of those cases, um, at least in our past 30 years of development history, the county is actually providing some funding to those developers, to those projects. So we have some levers at our disposal through that funding mechanism as well. It's not as if we have zero influence. Um, so it's not necessarily the case that there wouldn't be any sort of um local input. The other thing is many of those subsidized housing projects, because they're pursuing federal subsidies as well, they often have to do a federal environmental review. That is not a ministerial process either. It's not necessarily a huge lift if the site is zoned for what they're proposing, but it is another layer of review and it allows the sites to be screened for additional environmental issues and additional mitigation measures imposed that are not constrained by this local zoning process. So I just wanted to add that. That's great. Thank you for the additional context. Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, I guess I'll be a little more direct. And I, I think that uh, in general, there are many local governments that don't like uh, the state uh, shoving the land use decisions of cities and counties down our throats, but uh, that is what it is. And I think that being the case, you've done an excellent job of putting this together uh, in service of increasing our affordable housing stock. The need is there. I get it. But um, it's just, um, we've modernized our code and we've made it more predictable in this process, I think. Uh, we've got, uh, it's going to be a very interesting change when we see the arena numbers three times more than they were the previous eight years. Uh, we're going to have some changing communities in Santa Cruz County. Um, uh, but uh, the need is there. Uh, but um, I wish we could do it on our own and not have the state tell us how to do it. Supervisor Hernandez. You know, it, it seems like we have, you know, limited amount of land and we have more than half the housing need is for affordable and very affordable. Um, so I, I kind of had a question kind of direction of, of, of uh, Supervisor Koenig's. Uh, for the sake of clarity, uh, what it means ministerial. Um, so for the afford, there's there is affordable, and the second criteria is I should say one or more times in the housing element. Is that correct? What's the number of the affordable? It's twenty percent that we set. So the twenty percent figure comes. Or from, is that a state? Figure? That's from the state law, and so what it what it means basically is if a house and there there's multiple sort of more detailed criteria for projects to qualify for this processing that's outlined in your staff report so for example it has to include at least 16 units it has to be a density of at least 20 units an acre we've already basically vetted these sites that we're proposing to put in this district for those requirements but still the applicant has to propose something consistent with that criteria to get this processing type but the basically is 20% of the total units in the project must be affordable to lower income households per state law in order to qualify for the ministerial process. So that's for the second one too, the one or more times in the housing element, they still have to have the affordable. Yes, um, that second bullet just simply, this is, forgive me, 
pretty wonky. <laughs> it comes out of the state statute language, which is also quite wonky. So basically, it's just a different description of how we got to select the sites on our table seven on our rezoning list. So seven of the sites landed on that rezoning list and are proposed to have this min layer added to them because those sites appeared in prior cycles in our housing element inventory in prior cycles, so years ago. That's just how they landed on the rezoning list. The other 21 sites are there because the yield estimate that we have for them on the rezoning list includes a significant number of lower income units. So we're projecting that we can get a significant number of lower income units on those sites. And because of that, we fell into this state law requirement that we have to offer those sites ministerial processing if they check all the boxes. So 20% affordable units, it's not 20% of the base density and then they get a density bonus. I'll give you a super simple example. Applicant is proposing 100 units, 20 of those units have to be lower income affordable. The reason we don't expect a lot of market rate developers to go for this is because they generally say that it's not feasible financially to provide 20% of the total units as developable, as lower income affordable units. We don't have any track record of applicants proposing to build market rate projects with 20% low income. Maybe it'll happen in the future, maybe not. Either way, the state law requires us to offer this option to them if they include at least 20% lower income. But we think more than likely, it's probably going to be your affordable housing developers like your Midpens and Edens and whomever else that are going to uh, qualify for and take advantage of this processing type. You know, given that these are ministerial projects, I think it really streamlines and takes out the bureaucracy. I mean, where there's just, I mean, talk about even bypassing CEQA. I think there's a lot of cost savings for developers, um, benefits developers. I mean, we should really have a frank discussion about, you know, I mean, there's, a, like I said, there's a, there's a need for like half the housing that we need for our inventory housing element is for affordable. I mean, we should have the discussion uh, to really push for that. I, I noticed that the planning commission actually passed for 25%. Was that correct? They made a motion to include in their resolution in which they recommended to the board their recommendation on this issue. In their resolution, it says they recommend that we encourage applicants to provide 25% affordable. That's as far as we could go without getting... Um, caught up in state law. Um, so the state law requires that we offer applicants this option if they hit that threshold of 20%. We can't set the bar higher. But again, our expectation based on decades of development history is more than likely it's going to be 100% affordable developers that are pursuing this. So, you know, and my last I question don't know is, that it would matter. My last question is mm -hmm. the state... I know on the housing element, we differentiated between very low and low affordable. Does the state differentiate between very low and the requirement low for is this, for yeah. this uh, criteria for the streamlining? So the requirement defines low as encompassing low, very low, and extremely low. So it could be any of those three categories. <laughs> Well, it's not more criteria, it's just flexible. So if you're anywhere in that 80% of median or below for these units, then that would check the box for the 20%. Um, well, thank you all for the presentation. And I um, also share the concerns that are brought up by my colleagues about the fact that, you know, the state is largely taking away local control over developments within our community. And, you know, we, I, I foresee having um, sort of the um, Santa Cruz City Council, how frustrated people are when developments come in and we have a little say over it, how frustrating people will be um, moving forward as some of these projects come online with the inability to um, have public um, weigh in on these projects. I did have a question because I was, I'm also concerned around the, um, 
the 25, the 20 to 25 percent affordability. Um, I am very supportive of the, the planning commission's recommendation, which was um, the four votes in favor with one person absent to support uh, 25 percent affordable. Um, in the staff report, it um, largely refers to you know needing to study the implications of 20 to 25 percent. And it doesn't really speak to the fact that there's, you know, something in state law that says we can't do this. And so that for me is a little concerning because um, I would have hoped that that language would be present because if it's a matter of whether we want to study it or not, I think one of the best things we can do is move forward with 25 percent, given that, um, you know, we really need to meet these uh, arena numbers. And um, and in order to do so, we're really going to have to push for more affordable housing being built in these new developments. And with, you know, ministerial approval, removing the public's ability to weigh in, uh, it removes any kind of sequel analysis, it removes the board's ability to weigh in, um, and it provides more uncertain, more certainty for developers, which can help reduce costs. It would seem that we should be trying to maximize the amount of affordable housing in these new, new developments to the greater extent possible. Um, and so maybe you all could speak to that, but you know, what I would, I think would be fair in this instance is, you know, if we have a minimum of 20% affordable and we have an additional 5% that could be for affordable that could be reached through the use of section eight vouchers, we wouldn't necessarily be in violation of state law, but we would also be trying to maximize affordable housing in these ministerially approved projects. So the question came up during the planning commission hearing and we referred them to county council, who was um, Justin Cummings. I don't know if Jason was briefed on that detail, but Justin did advise that he did not believe it would be consistent with this particular state law if we made it a mandatory requirement that they do 25% low income in order to get this processing. And that's why they they modified their motion and made it just to include in the planning commission resolution to your board that they encourage applicants to include 25, but the original wording was still in there that the project must include 20%. So in other words, they added it to their recommendation to the board, but they did not add it to the proposed ordinance language because our council at the time said that was not consistent with the state law and it would set us up to have potentially our certification of the housing element revoked. I don't know, Jason, if you want to weigh in on that. <laughs> yeah, no, I haven't been briefed on that specific, very specific issue. And so I would want to go back and talk with Justin about it. I support Justin's analysis, um, you know, in the first instance without having spoken with him in more detail about it. Um, but that's all I'll be able to say on it right now. Well, if that's a motion, I would support that, you know, about 25%. I think that, you know, I really do think that we need to push for more affordable housing. And it would have been helpful to have that information prior to us taking action today. And so I'm wondering, if, well, I, what I would like to, to see if we could discuss or entertain would be a motion to um, accept, the staff's accept the staff's recommendation um, and add that we in, include within the language of the ordinance preference for 25% inclusionary with 5% being achieved through um, Section 8 housing vouchers. And I don't know if that would trigger us having to have this come back to the board for the first reading again on August 27th. Yes, it would. It would, it would, it would, it would require, I think, more staff work basically to determine what could be brought back on August 27th. August 27th is pretty fast to, to cut to. I'm just, to, to I'm just looking at the, just because of the way that it's worded in the staff report. So, um, but it does, I mean, if we're, if we're giving up our ability to review these projects and to weigh in on these projects, and there is a possibility that we can have increased affordability built into it, then I think that we should be trying to maximize affordability the greatest extent possible. So that's, that would be the recommendation that I would like to, to see. How did entertain that motion or second that motion either or yeah. would, would the chair consider it just it strikes me that we just need some additional work being done by council. I don't see why we, we should take action today. I mean, I feel like we can just table the item, come back with the answer to this question at the next. How much time you think you would need um, to answer it? Um, I mean, I have a lot of concerns that this would 
invalidate our entire housing element by taking this additional action. I mean, this is not an insignificant thing that's just being thrown out there. I want to point that out. Um, so I'm not supportive of, of the current motion. I think that what we should do instead is just have an analysis come back and either the item comes back as is because it was determined by our council that it wouldn't, that it'd be a problematic or uh, this additional direction could be something that could be incorporated in um, as a possibility for us to consider it at the next meeting. I'd, I'd be supportive of that because it does sound like, you know, based on what we were being told, there's, uh, you know, what's in state law versus, you know, what wasn't, which, which wasn't included in our gender report. And, you know, this notion that there may need to be a study. And so I think having more information come back as to whether or not we can increase the inclusionary to 25% um, based on state law and whether or not we could satisfy those requirements with other forms of subsidies. So for example, Section 8 vouchers, um, which would, you know, help for there to be a fair market return, but also help us as we're trying to, to meet our inclusionary requirements. And so if that's something we can have, then I'd be supportive of that. Well, my recommendation, if that was the case, would be to direct us to come back with this item on the on the on the twenty seventh with with whatever uh, recommendations staff have based on your discussion and based on further work done by my office to confirm uh, the legality. And, and then just for clarification, because I know you mentioned time constraints, is that enough time for you all to come back or should we actually, you know? It's enough, to, it's definitely enough time for, for me and my office to come back. I'm concerned that um, when we start talking about adding an additional 5% and dealing with housing vouchers and things like that, that, that staff would need more time to look into those issues um, as opposed to just some kind of a percentage where it's like 25% versus 20%, uh, something like that. Yeah, I would say that we should just have county council go through that effort uh, of seeing what that legal background uh, would yield. Uh, we can have discussions, um, you know, internally, but um, in terms of continuing it, it's probably too soon to just do it in one meeting. So I, I think there's probably a little bit more staff time that's going to go into this. Um, could, could I ask just a point of clarification? I, I Is there going to be a vote on this motion? Well, it sounds like you need us to direct you to do it. Is that correct, Council? Yeah, we, we yes. I need I need a clear recommend a clear motion. Yes, I mean not the motion that's on the table, um, but a motion to come back in September with whether this is possible based on this framework. Any any yeah. motion, yeah. <laughs> I think it needs a vote. If yeah, yeah. It's yeah. there's be, going yeah. to be, but yeah, was, yeah. I think uh, I, I would suggest maybe two meetings. Give us some okay. time to yeah, get so over that. That's going to go that way. Oh, this second meeting in September, it sounds like. On or before? Yeah, at least not before. Um. Right. <laughs> so it, it sounds like what the motion could be would be to return to the board with this item or continue the item to honor to come back to the board on or before the second meeting in September with additional information regarding the possibility that the board can increase the inclusionary requirements above the 20% threshold. I'll, I'll second that. And I'm going to say that I'm not necessarily supportive of doing that, but I just want the research to be done because I have serious concerns about how this is going to play out. But I, I mean that, but I think that we should have the research so you feel prepared for the, the vote. And so, and I also, I was just stating that as a motion. I don't know if I can actually make that motion or if that should be made by purpose. well i think you need to withdraw the first motion that you had a second i'll withdraw the first one all okay. right um yeah if, if you're asking whether rosenberg's allows you to do it yeah there's no prohibition to you doing it yeah okay so i'll second his second motion after the first one have been withdrawn okay so i have a motion by supervisor coming seconded by supervisor friend um and with chair yeah can i just ask i mean are there any um potential repercussions as far as how this uh, impacts our, our kind of, I mean, I assume the state wants us to basically pass what we said we were going to do in our housing element as soon as possible. Is there a deadline that we're coming up on? Because of course, if we did come back uh, at whatever first meeting in September and we decide we're going to change it, then there has to be additional time to actually make those changes in the ordinance. What what state yes. deadlines are we dealing uh, with? Thank you. So we have a calendar. Of course, it's always tentative. We don't know what's going to happen at hearings, but um, uh, the longer it takes us to create this code language, 
um, we we have the first batch of proposed re rezoning. So um, I think it's 20, uh, I'm sorry, 75 parcels altogether. We're dividing them into roughly two, two batches for the purpose of doing the actual rezonings. And so our current tentative calendar was to bring um, the Planning Commission a study session on the first batch of rezonings next month. And then some of the applicants are, uh, or some of the you know folks who hold some of these sites are um, actually some of the affordable housing developers that we have committed funding to. And they are um, hoping that our tentative calendar will play out such that their sites might be rezoned by the end of 2024. So any additional weeks we add to this could affect any of those folks as they're trying to apply for state subsidies federal subsidies. So it, it does have impact on possibly a few projects in the pipeline. And, and it could also impact the state's review of our continued certification status. I wouldn't say that just this one change would, would impact that, but the longer it takes us to implement certain projects, the more room it gives potential critics out there to allege to the HCD that we're not implementing our programs in a timely manner. So there could be some, you know, third party allegations and requests for HCD to potentially consider revoking our certification. So, yeah. you know, you just don't know how it's going to play out. And, and are we managing to the uh, 15th of December deadline to rezone these 75 parcels? Is that correct? Um, we believe we'll have a little bit more time than that. It's still a work in progress, I think. <laughs> um, we don't have anything on paper, um, but we have an indication that we should have three years to do the rezoning, but um, we don't have any legal enforceable document that we could mm -hmm. show that at the moment. So uh, I don't know if Jason wants to weigh in on that. <laughs> um, so it's, it's a work in progress. I'll put it that way. So, you know, the more we can, tackle things in a timely manner, I would say would be the less risky course of action, if right. I can put it that way. Okay, thanks. I mean, well, I'm not going to support the motion, not because I don't think we need more affordable housing, which just feels a little bit like a wild goose chase. We've already had county council during the planning commission tell us that state law says it's 20%. It's got to be 20%. Uh, we have our housing staff here telling us the people that are going to take advantage of this law are already affordable housing developers. They're probably developing 100% affordable housing anyway. I mean, not to mention the idea that like we're going to somehow require them to use Section 8 vouchers, which are limited um, project-based vouchers. I mean, we just can't assume that the folks developing these properties are going to be able to to acquire those. So um, but I think we should just move forward with what we have before us today. Staff's done a ton of work to prepare it and has a ton more work uh, ahead with rezoning these 75 properties. So um, again, not that I'm not sympathetic to build as much affordable housing as possible. I just don't think that this would actually accomplish that. And Mr. Chair, I agree with that. I mean, if it's a substitute motion, I think we ought to go with what we have before us. Um, and um, I'm just afraid that I, I just, I, I, the, 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 the state has the law and I don't think we're going to be able to make very much. Uh, and the state's messed with us enough in this, as I mentioned. So I, I agree. I, I just prefer to go ahead with what we have before us. And it's no reflection on the need for more affordable housing. I just think it's a cleaner, cleaner way to go. Um, all right, I'll make a substitute motion that we uh, approve the recommended actions. Um, and also direct county council just to give us a for, you know report on uh, what sort of the legality around the 2025 percent. So I mean, it gives us the ability to consider that in the future uh, without jeopardizing the current timeline. Okay. Um, I'll second that. Okay, so we have a motion by Supervisor Koenig, second by Supervisor McPherson. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just withdraw my motion um, at this time because I do, I am supportive of 20% inclusionary. Um, I'm going to continue to advocate for more inclusionary. I do think that moving forward, because I think one of the big concerns that I have is that there's an inconsistent, there's something that's very inconsistent with what we're hearing today and what's presented in our agenda report. What we've heard today is that um, the 
within the state law, it says that the base inclusionary needs to be 20%. When the planning commission recommended that we increase that to 25%, what's in the staff report has says nothing that has to deal with whether that's consistent with state law or in violation of state law. It just says that there needs to be more study. And so that's very different from what we're hearing. If, if on the one end, county staff is saying, we need to study this a little bit more, um, you know, there's an opportunity for us to be able to, to, to change uh, whether that inclusionary percentage is 20 or 25 or higher, because it doesn't say that it's in violation of state law. But when we're hearing today that it is, it would be potentially in violation of state law, that leaves me with little information in terms of whether or not it actually would be in violation or not. Can we make these changes? And I think that it needs to be more transparent to the public in these instances where, as we've heard today from many of our workers, and as we continue here in the public, we really need to be maximizing affordable housing. We need to reach these arena target numbers. And my objective is to try to make sure that we're on target with that, if not exceeding those numbers for low income uh, households. And so I'm supportive of the 20 percent um, and the action that we're taking today. But I'm just when when these types of items come before us, um, I think that it's just should be known that there are members of this board who really want to see us go as far as we can with affordable housing. And if there's a violation of state law that, you know, we'd be in violation of if we increase these percentages, it'd be good to know that it would be good to have that cited so that we can see that in writing versus saying that we need to study this a little bit more because that leads me to believe that a study could be that we, we try it and we see whether or not it's possible. And if we need to make changes, we can come back and do that. So um, I'll withdraw my motion. I'm supportive of uh, the direction that we're going in. And I do think that it would be good for us to get, um, you know, whether it's a memo or some kind of feedback from um, county council about how increasing 20% to a higher percentage would be in violation of state law. We'll provide your board members with an attorney client memo on that. Maybe if it could be passed on to the planning commission so they can get their answers as well. If your board directs us to do that, we'll do that. Well, I guess as a friendly amendment, can we have that memo also transmitted to our planning commission members? Sure. Yeah, I have no issue with that. Okay. All right. So we have a motion by Supervisor Koenig, second by Supervisor McPherson to approve the staff recommendations with additional direction to uh, provide the board with um, information about whether or not they could have this percentage increased and also to transmit that same memo to uh, our planning commissioners. And with that, I will entertain a roll call vote. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Friend. Aye. Hernandez. Aye. McPherson. Aye. And Cummings. Aye. That passes unanimously. Okay. So that brings us to our next item, which is item number 11. Consider directing community development and infrastructure to create an overlay zone or combining district to be applied to property in all zoning designations within a specified proximity to existing electricity transmission centers that allow energy storage systems to be developed with a discretionary planning commission conditional use permit where determined to be of significant benefit to public health, safety, and welfare as public quasi public community facilities and take related actions. This was an item that was brought forward by district four supervisor Hernandez and district five supervisor McPherson. So I'll turn it over to you all. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. If I could, um, I want to introduce this item. Uh, first of all, by thanking uh, supervisor Hernandez and the partnership and addressing this, um, Decarbonizing um, our economy, our economy, and combating climate-related impacts remain some of our really big challenges of today. And Santa Cruz County has established uh, climate goals in the 2022 Climate Action and Adaptation Plan, and the Central Coast Community Energy is on its pathway to achieve 100% clean and renewable energy by 2030. Uh, 15 years, and that's in its five county region, uh, and that'd be 15 years ahead of the state goal. Um, achieving these um, these ambitious climate goals are, is going to require some unprecedented amounts of renewable energy, and energy storage is required to meet the climate goals. There's no question about it, and the, the state is planning for 52,000 megawatts of energy storage to help balance the supply and demand across the grid. In Santa Cruz County, uh, the energy storage can provide critical backup uh, to aging infrastructure and help strengthen local grid 
reliability and support disaster preparedness, response and recovery, um, advances in battery chemistry and safety uh, protections in addition to new battery safety regulations such as what was introduced and passed by Senator John Laird in his recent battery safety law, Senate Bill 38, will help ensure uh, the safe deployment of energy storage. Santa Cruz County will benefit from evolving, uh, evolving the zoning and codes uh, to accommodate energy storage as a critical uh, technology that provides significant benefit for our public health, safety, and welfare in the county. Uh, the code changes can be bifurcated or limited to outside the coastal zone because the only transmission substations capable of interconnecting battery storage are outside the coastal zone. Uh, here. So battery storage is located adjacent to existing substations. There are four of them in Santa Cruz County, and it also helps avoid more environmentally impact, impactful projects such as new energy generations projects and long-range transmission facility upgrades. There is a new state permitting process, Assembly Bill 205, for this scale of energy storage systems uh, that would take permitting authority away from the county. Because we want to retain our land use authority, creating a regulatory path to considering energy storage projects next to existing substations is important. Energy storage is also imperative to build resiliency to our infrastructure. And to speak more about this and the technicalities about the resiliency factor, I'd like to invite Dave Reed, our Director of Office of Response, Recovery, and Resiliency, to present additional information to the board after Supervisor uh, Sir Hernandez may want to make some remarks. Yes, I, I got some um, brief remarks. You know, we have um, really ambitious uh, climate goals that we have in front of us to, you know, have renewable energy with, um, you know, CARB's mandates, the governor's mandates, you know, one of them is we have a uh, 100% EVs by 2035. Uh, we have increasing uh, climate change with bo both those alone are gonna put a tremendous uh, amount of pressure on our existing grids. So these type of projects are, you know, needed in our state. Um, energy, energy storage is required to meet our our climate goals. It's simply that's that simple. You know, energy storage is going to help balance the supply and demand across the grid. And so, I think it's imperative that Santa Cruz County, you know, will benefit from updating these uh, zoning codes uh, to accommodate en energy storage, uh, which is you know critical. Um, it'll provide you know, benefits to our environment, public health, safety, uh, public resource and welfare. So I think we, you know, it's some, one of the things that we have to look at to meet the, the, the demands that we have for uh, climate change. All right, with that, I'll turn it over to Dave Reed um, for further presentation on this item. Good afternoon, board. I'll, I'll try to be brief. I wanted to just uh, contextualize a little bit about why um, these types of projects uh, serve a resiliency function. Um, this diagram shows the flow of electricity. So if we think of the flow of electricity like water, the generation of electricity is like a lake or a reservoir that stores or produces that energy. The high power transmission lines are the large diameter pipes that bring that energy across great distances. What we're talking about today or what is being proposed by the board um, for consideration is at the transmission substation level. So that's where you take those high pipes, those high, high capacity pipes or those high capacity lines, you step them down so that they can then serve the community. The reason resilience becomes an, an aspect of these types of projects is because electricity flows similar to water. Um, and one of the concepts of closest demand in electricity, so like water taking the path of least resistance, electricity flows to where it is needed. So by siting these facilities in our county, there is the potential that during a disaster or during a need, that stored capacity, that stored electricity, that reservoir would be available to the closest demand um, in, in the proximity of our county. So there is that opportunity, as, as the board members mentioned, 
around resilience. So I wanted to contextualize that that a little bit for everybody here as well as the public. And then um, the board asked me to just provide a quick update or a quick presentation on where these major substations are. There are other neighborhood scale in the previous slide. There are other distribution substations and neighborhoods throughout our community, but there are, as the board mentioned, four sites in our county. One of them is in the unincorporated or is in the incorporated city of Scotts Valley. This one here, um, just near the intersection of Scotts Valley Drive and Mount Hermon. Um, the other three, as were mentioned by the board, that are in the unincorporated county. One is right behind Dominican Hospital, um, and you'll see the existing uh, uh, zoning designations in these figures for context for your discussion. Um, the other site is in Aptos, um, across from Aptos High School, and um, adjacent to Freedom Boulevard. Those are the existing zonings there. And the third site is in South County, um, off of Green Valley Road, um, and those are the ex adjacent uh, zoning there. Um, as with many decisions before your board, citing these types of facilities as citing um, affordable housing or other projects always has competing priorities. So ultimately, this is a decision of the board. I'm just presenting some of this context for your discussion and happy to answer questions if there are any. Are there any further comments from the board members who bring this forward? Or? Uh, I, I just, uh, storage is a huge factor in us achieving our goals uh, for climate change ad adaptation. And uh, it's absolutely necessary to do this. And I think this is a, a, a very good, safe way to, to go about and accomplish that goal. All right. With that, um, I'll go ahead and open it up to public comment to see if there's any member of the public who would like to speak to us on this item. This is item number 11 on our agenda. Please come forward. You'll have two minutes. Yes, hello. My name is still James Ewing Whitman. Maybe I missed something because I didn't see in any of the pictures that there are any examples of actual energy storage. Am I wrong? I'm asking for some feedback because I saw I took pictures. I have them on my phone. There was some interesting information, but what is actually the storage that's being suggested? I didn't see it. So what's the purpose of this? I really have to wonder. Somebody needs to question the stuff that you're going on. There's all kinds of ways to deal with the renewable energy. Only carbon that these agendas are really pushing are the carbon that, are, that human beings are made of. We are facing almost extinction levels of carbon dioxide. The bullshit that this is a dangerous gas, where it is really only one part per 2,378 of the other parts of our atmosphere. Do you think that that's damaging? You're a real special kind of stupid. Now, I don't always want to be rude. I like to be polite. There's lots of alternative energy sources. Let's take, for example, what was stopped, what was it, 1978, I think, when the um, coal-fired power plant at Moss Landing it was a coal-fired power plant. You know, UCSC stopped that program in 1987. They discovered that per vertical acre, they were able to produce an algae by pushing all those toxic chemicals into the algae beds. And it was 125 to 400 times more efficient than anything on land. Obviously, they didn't talk about hemp. So these agendas, you know, I'm glad I'm here, I'm back and forth, but um, sometimes utter ridiculous in this room. I mean, I know in the past three years, I've picked up at least 15 UCSC textbooks that were published in the last 15 years. Some of them I only spent five minutes on, some of them I spent a couple hours, but all of them were garbage. Thank you. Thank you. Any other member of the public would like to speak to us on this item? Thank you. Um, like Mr. Whitman, I I would like to see what these battery storage centers would look like. Um, we didn't see anything like that. And, and I'm assuming they're gonna be battery storage. But we need to really question the safety of that technology too. We've seen fires, multiple fires at the Moss Landing energy storage site and they burn for days. Do we really want to have that in our residential zones? I don't think so. I would favor 
multiple microgrid, which is what I thought this county had already adopted, to disperse energy storage throughout the county in small facilities that when an area gets knocked out, they have backup. You only have to look at what happened over the weekend on Highway 152 in Watsonville. The power in all of the area of uh, Watsonville out by the base of the mountain was knocked out for about 24 hours because someone hit a, a power pole. And um, had there been a microgrid there, it, it could have prevented those people from being completely with power for as long as they were. I also have a concern about the um, electromagnetic frequency of these storage centers and the impacts on those who could be living or working around them. There needs to be full disclosure about that because many people are sensitive to the, the electromagnetic fields that are around these facilities. I'm a ham radio operator. When I go by the one that was not mentioned here on uh, Sukal Drive in Aptos, it, it um, causes interference with my radio, thank, no thank matter where I put the squelch. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Saying none, I'd like to see if there's any member of the public online who would like to speak to us on this item. We have no speakers online, Chair. Okay, let's bring it back to the board for any questions, comments. I do have some questions and comments, um, but I want to see if there's any other board members who'd like to speak on this item. Buzzers, friend. Um, I'm supportive of the concept. I think it's important that we have the additional uh, battery storage. Um, I just, uh, I'll be interested when it comes back with the ordinance in particular on the an ag parcel conversion, I think, is going to be important for us to review um, uh, those issues. And so I, I think that it'll be interesting to see in the ordinance that it comes back. I just want to ensure, I mean, I'm, I'm sure that this will be part of the discussion, but ensuring that it comports with Measure J, et cetera. I mean, we do have one of the parcels there is actually listed as an agricultural parcel, the others. Uh, but I think that the points that Ms. Steinbrenner bring up on safety are important. I know that that's also something that was included in the board letter is something that would be required as part of the consideration of review in this. And so I think that, that the safety element is also part of the review. And I think that uh, those are all fair points that should be part of the ordinance when it comes back. Great. Okay. Supervisor Conninger. Uh, yeah, thank you, Chair. And thank you to my colleagues for bringing this forward. Um, I agree that it's... Um, an important step towards a more resilient electricity grid locally. I'm just curious. Uh, I mean, to the to the point uh, mentioned by um, Ms. Steinberger and the de, you know desire to create microgrids. Um, is there any consideration of doing this at the distribution substation as well as a way to you know further expand uh, the storage opportunities? Or is there some reason why I mean, just the transmission substation? I mean, have have we got her? particular interest around building out around transmission substations? Uh, is this addressing like an immediate need? Um, just, yeah, just sort of interested in the context there, how this law can ultimately be the most effective possible. Um, it's my understanding from, from conversations that uh, certain scale of projects need more, more square footage to accomplish what they're trying to achieve. So siting next to the major transmission stations um, you have the opportunity to create a bigger battery storage capacity. Um, certainly, as as evidenced by the attempt to do a microgrid at 17th and Capitola during the early days of development there, space is always a constraint um, <laughs> on any given project or in any given location. And I know that many of the uh, neighborhood scale substations are surrounded by single family residences and may not have the available land um, that these three sites may um, have. If I could uh, call, add to that, um, Chair Cummings, member of the board, um, Central Coast Community Energy has, has looked at microgrids extensively. Um, the issues primarily that are obstacles is siting, again, the residential neighborhood and then economics, the size of the batteries that would need to do it. So what Central Coast is now doing is emphasizing um, batteries at residential homes, and we actually have a battery at home program where we will um, pay, I believe, up to a third of the cost of a battery uh, at all homes, residential homes. So the idea is to spread it out to 
uh, throughout the neighborhoods with one or two batteries, and then that would then be adding to the resiliency of the network in a distributed way. Great, thank you. All right, I have a couple questions and comments. I'm wondering if you could just walk through, in particular, I see an Aptos and an, um, and in the substation Green Valley, the zoning that's surrounding those. I'm just wondering if you can kind of just break that down so that if, if, if that's possible. I might defer if there's a member of the uh, of CDI that wants to speak more on the on the zoning. This is just our current zoning. The, obviously, the CA is commercial ag, um, so the green um, in in South County, and then the the R designations are the residential designations. Uh, good afternoon, Chair, members of the board, Stephanie Hansen, Assistant Director in Planning and CDI. Um, as uh, uh, Supervisor Friend mentioned, and also now looking at this map, there's there's the um, potential for impacts to ag areas. Um, that would need to be studied before the ordinance would be uh, could be brought back. Um, also, I I don't think we mentioned acreage. Uh, uh, for one proposal, we were looking at approximately 13 acres of land needed for a facility. Yes, yeah, so it's it's a little bit. It can be large. I don't know that they all need to be that large, or if there's other options. But uh, that's how, how we understood the latest proposal. So I'm happy to answer any questions, but we would look, I think the directive is to allow the overlay to be utilized in any of our zoning districts. And so that's what we would analyze. Did, did you want to look at the Aptos? So this is the Aptos um, location as well. So the, <laughs> the light green is the residential agriculture. I wasn't privy to these maps earlier. Um, so there would, um, this is more of a residential area um, in our rural, uh, our residential zoning in our rural areas. The the impact would be lesser. It would be more considered if there was an impact to be um, that upon any residential uses in the area. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, and so I just, I guess my next question is in terms of out, community outreach. Just given the impacts that this is going to have on ag, I guess, is there any community outreach plan that we have associated with this proposal? Um, at, at this point, um, my role has been just to provide this information. If this moves forward, I'm sure we would work with CDI and figure out how that outreach plan would work. Yeah, and we'd have it. I we have every intention to do so. I think it's absolutely necessary to do so. Okay. Um, we have we have had some discussions with the ag interests uh, to this date, so we it hasn't we haven't left them out of the discussion. But if we wanted more input from them, certainly. Uh, mm -hmm. Just to, just to supplement, whatever comes back to your board on September twenty fourth, if you decide to move forward with it, it will go to the planning commission for a review and recommendation, and then come back to your board. And your board could also choose to send it to whatever commission, associated commission for uh, review and comment as well. I know that we've met with uh, local residents there in, in the District 4 uh, site, and I, I know the applicants, I've met with them as well. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess I'm supportive of, of where this is headed. I just you know, I think it's important, especially given some of the com comments we had today, that the community is really aware of what is happening here in terms of the impacts that it can potentially have on commercial ag land. And, and you know, the fact that it's going to be a discretionary planning commission permit means that it won't come to the board. And um, and I just have some, some concerns with, you know, the fact that it's discretionary. Um, I'm supportive of seeing what comes back i do think that it's a pretty tight timeline and so i would maybe suggest that um, we extend the timeline a bit further i mean if this has to go to the planning commission and then come back to us and there's a need for um, staff work to be done on this it just seems like a very rushed timeline because um that's i don't know the next planning commission meeting is when 
<laughs> Let me clarify, Supervisor. Yeah. It's not going to go to the Planning Commission before your board looks at it. Okay. So your, your, your board's going to take a look at it, decide what policy you would like to implement, and then it would go to the Planning Commission for review and recommendation. Chair, if I might, I, I, I think we probably need quite a bit more time. Um, as far as I understand it, there may be sequel impacts that we need to look at. Um, in which case we would probably need an RFP for a consultant to help us with CEQA. Um, so if, um, if the board would consider maybe uh, six months to return, I think that that would be helpful. I could, maybe the second meeting in October or something I'd go for, but I think that would be, <laughs> I know you're depressed. Yeah. Well, no, I just, uh, I think it can be, I think we can get done. I know there's a lot of pressure on the staff and you'd, you'd like that more time, but I'd like to have, I think the second meeting in October would be, would be acceptable to that. It would be impossible for us to perform a CEQA evaluation that's needed in that timeline. I think potentially a compromise is to come back earlier without the CEQA uh, evaluation, but with the board's understanding that it, once it proposes a policy to move forward, that it would have to be analyzed under CEQA, and so the timeline would continue to move forward. Um, I'm looking for a way to compromise yeah. staff's mm -hmm. priorities and understanding that the board has a lot of priorities that is given to staff yeah. um, to exercise with where does this get moved up into the chain and what gets bumped down. Um, it sounds like it's going to take a, a lot of staff resources to do this, um, you know, which is you know, within the board's discretion to uh, to order. But um, it sounds like you, it sounds like the two of you would like it to come back as soon as possible. And that's a path forward for it to come back as soon as possible. Yeah. Without putting the date on it, or do you, do you think we, we could get something back without the without the uh, inclusion of the sequel review or any kind of uh, yes to decide to, to to decide whether or not you're interested in adopting this kind of a policy at all and and um, right and and after that you know move forward with with the environmental analysis on it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, I, I would uh, move to see to come back with the additional information that we might need. Uh, without the CEQA inclusion in it uh, by um, the second meeting in October. Second. Yeah. So so it sounds like adopt staff recommendation, but uh, extend the return time to the second meeting in October. Is that correct? Correct. And I guess my understanding with that is that we'll get more, inf if there's you know a need for CEQA and further work to be done on this, we'll get that information at that point in time, and then we'll be able to decide whether we move forward or not with the implementation of the policy. Is that correct? Yeah, I think staff can, can just give a very basic initial read on, hey, we're providing you with this potential policy for you to adopt, and we're identifying that we're going to need to do CEQA associated with this, with this policy. So the timeline will continue to stretch out. Could, could we clarify, do you mean a policy as in uh, language in our general plan, or are we talking about the actual ordinance? Uh, the actual ordinance. Yeah, the actual so not or really a policy. But well, yeah, the policy being that they're interested, that the board is interested in seeing this use be developed and be used here. That's what I was referring Thank you. to. Just wanted to clarify. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I guess we will continue to see how this develops over time and and uh, we'll learn more about it when it comes back to the board um, but we now have a motion by supervisor McPherson seconded by supervisor Hernandez um, uh, to, to approve the recommended action um, but change the date for this return to the board um, I guess it would be at the second meeting in October on or before yeah, honorable for the second weekend. Okay, honor before the second meeting in October. Okay, so with that, I'll call roll call vote on this item. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Friend? Aye. Hernandez? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Cummings? Aye. That passes unanimously. Okay, um, I just want to check it to a time check if we want to move through the next item. Okay, seeing none in opposition, we'll move on to our last regular meeting item before we move into closed session. 
Um, this item is item number 12, consider adopting an ordinance enacting chapter 7.146 of the Santa Cruz County Code to prohibit the use of gas powered leaf blowers and approving CEQA exemption, approving concept on June 25th, 2024 and take related actions. And I'll turn it over back over to Dave Reed from our Office of Response Recovery and Resiliency to provide a presentation on this item. Thank you, uh, Chair and Board. Um, I'll be brief. Uh, this item is a consolidation of our standard second read, um, which is your first recommended action for your consideration. The second recommended action is just um, to update, uh, is an update I've provided in the memo around conversations I've had with uh, CARB as well as MBARD. Um, so I just want to highlight some of that research, um, and it's in the memo as well, but for the public, uh, in three areas, eligibility, is the first one. So uh, to provide clarity, as the conversation on the 25th um, asked to do so, uh, if you adopt the second read today, um, all private citizens in the unincorporated county would not be eligible for the MBARD LEAP. That's the Lawnmower Exchange Program. Um, they would not be eligible. Um, as soon as that uh, ordinance is in effect, regardless of enforcement, um, the MBARD uh, leadership has expressed that, that private citizens would not be eligible. Business entities um, and what requirement is needed to define a business entity is unclear, but business entities, commercial entities serving in the landscape space would still be eligible for the funding. The second piece is um, on the funding specifically. Um, it is limited. Um, there is not a clear path, at least according to uh, EMBARD staff, that this funding will continue from the state. Currently, they have around 200,000, a little over 200,000 eligible for commercial exchanges and a little over 30,000 for residential exchanges. That funding is defined and de designed to be available to the three counties for which EMBARD oversees, so Santa Cruz, Monterey, and San Benito counties. So. There is some concern um, around the equitable distribution of those funds um, that was expressed to me by MBARD staff. The third piece is program implementation. Um, so we, as the board discussed, there are, uh, you know, outreach barriers to meeting the needs of our, our community um, and making sure that they're aware of this ordinance when it becomes in effect and then when it becomes enforced. So making sure that we're able to reach people takes, will take some time. Um, obviously, the financial barriers of the current program design from MBARD requires somebody to spend the money up front um, to have the technology capabilities of applying and then to try and receive those funds back. So there's a financial barrier. Uh, for There could be a financial barrier for folks. And then obviously, there could be a technology barrier just um, for folks that may not have the, the tools and resources available to go through a permit um, or a application process and an exchange process. So um, my recommendation for your consideration is um, that we look at ways to partner with community-based organizations that are in this space. Um, specifically, uh, one example would be the Community Action Board that operates our Day Worker Center um, and find ways to partner both on the, the outreach and education programming side of things, but also to work with MBARD to see if we can get grant funding to a community-based organization to pull, to purchase the equipment outright, and then make that exchange in real time so that there isn't that financial or technical barrier for implementation. So that's all I have for my update and happy to answer questions as you deliberate on next steps. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, with that, we'll open up to the public to see if there's any member of the public who would like to speak to us on this item. If so, you'll have two minutes and please approach the podium. I'm not going to apologize for being rude, but I think I'm more effective if I'm not. Um, you know, to, for example, there were, I got here before the meeting started. There were 100 people in here and in the office, but I was assertive and I spoke first because why not? I know the rules. You know, something I had to leave because it was actually, I think, one of the only words that's more absolutely ridiculous than the term fossil fuels is the firm chest feeding. So anybody can do their own research, but in 1892, Rockefeller and a bunch of other criminals met in Geneva to figure out scarcity because they were trying to eliminate hemp and natural alcohol at the time, so they created fossil fuels. You know, the next most plentiful fluid 
on planet Earth is oil. It's created in subduction zones where the oceanic crust has olivine and it partially melts to create the lubricant called oil. And I want you to know, when I got a geology degree over 30 years ago, they didn't tell me that. So that's an example of this educational system that is an indoctrination system. I will say that I was somewhere on Saturday and a leaf blower across the street was so damn offensive, it was awful. Now, I know that they can be almost as effective when they're at a lower volume. But this reduction of the small internal combustion engine is absolutely ridiculous. Personally, if I would have known other engines were available, the vehicle I purchased in 2001 weighs 1,100 pounds, 270 horsepower, 500 foot-pounds of torque. There's a vehicle, there's an engine, the Opak diesel, came out. The first design was 1896, but the vehicle's available in 1999. Um, 325 horsepower, 625 foot-pounds of torque, and 275 pounds. That's what's powering these drones. So this is a greed and ignorance thing, and I'm here to witness change, and I'm trying to be as polite as I can. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Becky Steinbrunner. I worked for a number of years as a landscape maintenance worker. And I carried a backpack and I put on my ear protection and it just was part of the job. I think it's ridiculous to impose more rules and penalties on people who are trying to make a living doing that kind of work, barely making it, and to insist that they can no longer use gas-powered equipment that they've been able to purchase, that they can maintain themselves. I think this is folly. And I feel like it is something that your board is trying to do to make this county look good. When it, the effect of this in the bigger picture is really minuscule. It will cause problems and hardships for those out there who are trying to make a living. And you see them on the roads. You see them in your neighborhoods, I'll bet. But it's what they can do to put food on the family for their t on the table for their families. To impose these penalties and this restriction is going to very much hurt them. And I don't think it's fair. And I don't think it's necessary just to make this county look good politically. I don't know where, uh, if you've talked with the landscape industry, uh, what their feelings are. I don't know if you've approached any of these people working uh, in your neighborhood with a leaf blower. What do they think? Where would they charge these battery-powered blowers when they use them all day long? Where are they going to charge them? Please, I just think back off on this. We don't need more rules just to make this county look good. Thank you. Thank you. Are any members of the public online would like to speak to us on this item? Yes, Chair, we have a caller. Jane, your microphone is now available. Hello, Supervisors. I did read the staff memo, Dave, online last night. My comments uh, are with it in mind. Air and noise pollution does not discriminate by age, income, or color. Anyone living near the air and noise pollution of gas-powered blowers is impacted adversely, especially those individuals who are already bear more of the burden of other forms of air pollution, and that includes those who are using these gas um, gasoline blowers. Whether powered by electricity or gasoline, leaf blowers spread dust, grit, animal feces, and other airborne toxins throughout every neighborhood, no matter the income level of the residents. Recently, in our walks through Santa Cruz, we have even begun to see more and more residents in neighborhoods using, get this, brooms and rakes as an alternative to blowers. Clearly, they have already become aware, educated by the discussions taking place today and in the news media of the heretofore unknown risks they have historically accepted as necessary. Instead of handling heavy equipment, 
They're moving arms and legs, doing some bending and flexing, and getting good aerobic exercise, good cardiovascular conditioning. Therefore, in terms of equity and justice for all whose health is impacted by gasoline-powered leaf blowers, this ordinance should be approved. Let's not go backward, please. Let's get this prohibition approved at a minimum. Then OR3 and CDI can get busy finding grant funding. I look forward to your vote for approval today and thank you for hearing me. We have no further speakers, Chair. Okay, I'll bring it back sure. to the board then for a comments and questions. I'll start to my left with Supervisor McPherson. Yeah. Um it came to my attention that after we discussed this earlier, that um, the first reading of this ordinance, the city of Santa Cruz adopted a similar ordinance, but made sure it did not apply to properties of 10 acres or more. I think that's a, a reasonable, um, uh, not request policy. Um, larger properties do require more maintenance and power tools. And I, I'd like to make a motion that we not adopt this proposed ordinance today, but instead request that Supervisor Koenig, who was the maker of the motion at first, uh, worked with county council to return with a revised ordinance um, for the first reading that includes the exemption of properties um, larger than 10 acres, similar to the one that was approved by the city of Santa Cruz. Okay. So motion um, on the floor by Supervisor McPherson. Is there a second well, to the motion? Yeah, I was going to, yeah, I was, okay. So, um, maybe Supervisor McPherson, we'll, we can come back, but because I think there might be a lot of conversation. You got it. We'll have, but we'll come back to you um, when it's time to make a motion. Supervisor Hernandez. No, I was, I was just going to say. I was just going to add to about the educational component, but we'll come back to that. Supervisor Friend. Yeah, I'm not uh, prepared to support it today as is. Um, I was the one at the last board meeting that had brought up this concern on the funding issue. Um, I'll say that it was disappointing that that research hadn't been done in advance of the first introduction of the item, but there's a few issues here. One, a decent amount of the discussion at that meeting, including a little bit of the board letter, was predicated on the fact that people would be able to get this fully funded, which isn't accurate. I mean, A, it's not even 100%, but B, it's clear that this would prevent residential owners uh, or residential folks from being able to qualify at all. But B, there's an uncertainty on the commercial side in my conversations with MBARD because of how you define commercial. I mean, we're, this is... Uh, to Ms. Steinbrenner's point, the folks that are um, disproportionately engaging, uh, that are disproportionately working in this industry uh, are understandably going to be hesitant to apply for a government rebate, um, are going to have language barriers and access barriers of um, accessing it, are not going to be aware that there's an ordinance within the unincorporated area that, by the way, is going to differ from the city of Capitola, the city of Scotts Valley, the city of Watsonville, the city of Santa Cruz. It's not even going to be a similar ordinance but may not even qualify for the commercial component. Maybe they don't have an EIN, maybe um, the requirements of, and so if at the end of the day, the board believes in equity and not punishing low-income residents and small business owners, I think this isn't the right time to enact this. I think that what we can also say is that we believe that this is the right policy moving forward, though. I mean, I think that that's a reasonable thing, but you would need to have this robust outreach program. Then you would come back to see the efficacy of it. Uh, to Ms. Steinbrenner's point, I did exactly what you said. I reached out to local landscape companies. I literally walked up my street and spoke to folks that were using this. Not only was Actually, nobody was even aware this was going on. Um, there was a significant amount of concern and opposition. I called the Day Labor Workers Center, and uh, there was significant opposition of those that were spoken to. There were 75 folks that were there, and it was overwhelmingly opposed. That doesn't necessarily mean that we can't do something. I just think the timing of it doesn't make sense. I think that what the board should say is, we want to move there, but we also don't want to impact low-income business owners or residents. And by taking action today or even incorporating uh, Supervisor McPherson's motion, which might be the best policy for the board in, say, six months or a year, we would still be having those impacts. So 
it's tough because we're we're always presented with this binary choice and the community will judge you as you're you're not being environmental right you know you're not leading on these environmental issues if you do this but but i don't think that's really actually what's before us i think that we can make the statement that we believe it's the right thing to do but given this information on the rebates and the lack of outreach on the rebates it's not the right thing to do now um and we can express that that view moving forward so if what's before us is is the recommended actions i'll be voting no and that's the rationale on it what i would like to see though is the board direct <laughs> Um, and potentially, although I recognize the finances are tight, putting some money toward that outreach, I think is actually going to be essential. I mean, I think that just trying to find grant funding for this is going to be very challenging, Mr. Reed. I appreciate you being um, cognizant of our, our uh, financial situation. I just don't think it's realistic. But I think that we need to make sure that we've done all that outreach that we can possibly do. And once we've both, A, the funds have been exhausted, and B, we're, we're confident that the information is out there and the opportunities are out there, then the board should explore this as a policy, and that's just not today. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Supervisor Donegan. Uh, yeah, thank you. I mean, I fundamentally agree that, uh, I mean, if MBARD uh, is not going to extend the rebate program to residences and quasi commercial entities or commercial, you know, folks who probably who understand themselves as commercial entities, but uh, might not legally be. So um, that sort of defeats the whole purpose of bringing this forward uh, now and with the extended uh, enforcement period, which was to uh, give people constructive notice uh, that this was going to happen and give them uh, ample opportunity to apply for those rebates. I'm still trying to understand why that um, condition be put on the rebates. Um, and it's something about the equity component is all I can imagine is that somehow they don't want any particular region that has a ban in place or pending to have an advantage versus others. But at the same time, it disincentivizes the very nature of having a rebate program in the first place. So, so my understanding, but uh, Mr. Reed, if you had a different understanding, we had this conversation pretty extensively at, at MBARD, but CARB doesn't fund compulsory things. So meaning if, if we're making somebody do it, then there's no point in, because this is about changing behavior through an incentive. And so if the behavior is already being mandated, then there's, there's no, there's no incentive then at that point. So CARB doesn't allow for them, doesn't have refunds for compulsory. So Anyway, that's the point of why they created the rebate in the first place to go along with the ban on on new equipment, uh, sale of new equipment already occurring was to then incentivize, which became a word I saw in, in the dictionary about a decade ago, by the way, to incentivize this transfer of usage. But if we mandate it, then we've taken away that component. That's that's the rationale. This equities component is a different element that MBARD's concerned about, about the distribution within the counties of it and how folks learn about that, that distribution, but that's not the legal rationale through CARB. Well, interesting. I mean, I, I agree we should move, probably hold off on the implementation of this ordinance, that being the case, and uh, nevertheless go forward with the uh, educational component, um, because as, as uh, Supervisor Friend explained, the fact that we did approve a first read gives good indication that this is where the board would like to go at some point in the future. Um, so yeah, I think, and of course, acknowledging some of the input that Supervisor McPherson had as well, and wanted to make sure that the ordinance uh, aligns really perfectly with uh, that of the city of Santa Cruz or any, any other jurisdiction within the county that would consider this. I, I, um, so I, I'm trying to understand how we're going to figure out where all the uh, business licenses are at. Are we going to ask like the city of Watsonville? Because the city of Watson will do business in Santa Cruz. Um, and when it comes to educational component, um, I, last night I talked to possibly the biggest landscaper in probably the Central Coast, and they didn't know about this ordinance, uh, K and D. And so, I mean. If we talk to the biggest one in the Central Coast, uh, Supervisor Friends alluding to the smaller mom and pops uh, that don't that are probably monolingual Spanish speakers, I'm sure they don't know. Um, how is it that we're going to find out? You know, through business licenses, through the City of Watsonville, our business licenses that we have um, to to do the outreach. Yeah. So, so as as initially conceived, uh, you're, you're right. We we would need to tap as many um, database resources as we can. For clarity's sake, for the board, we don't have at the unincorporated county level a business license program. 
Um, that could be something your board contemplates, but um, we would certainly reach out to the city um, of Santa Cruz, the city of Watsonville to see who is, uh, is operating under their license programs as landscapers. We would work with community action board and the day worker center. And then we would reach deeper into trusted voices um, and trusted community members to try and get the information out. Um, but in the absence of, of the unincorporated county having a business license program, it would be using those those other resources to do that outreach to start with. And if I can just um, take a comment on this, what it sounds like is that um, we're moving in the direction of tabling this item for the ordinance, at least, I would imagine, until future date, um, just given the fact that, you know, what we've learned here today and which, what, what I'm really concerned with is that if we do take action, then private citizens become ineligible. And for me, I think that what's more important is that we're letting people know about MBARD's program and we're trying to get people to, you know, understand what they can, what the benefits are of that program, especially private citizens and commercial um, um, businesses, so that they can start accessing these funds and they can start, um, you know, really trying to convert their equipment from gas powered to electric. And through doing that outreach and education, and through trying to, you know, um, get people to adopt this new technology, we can actually see from Embards and, you know, are there a lot of people who are applying for this and who are actually taking advantage of this program? Where are these people actually coming from? Because $200,000 for commercial across three counties and 30000 for residential across three counties doesn't seem like a whole lot of funding to go around. And I think, you know, it's really important that, um, to supervise a friend's point, you know, um, we're acknowledging the board's position, um, but rather than coming in with, you know, a blunt object and trying to, you know, force people to to move in this direction, we're really trying to use um, education and outreach and this incentive program to get people to change their behaviors. And that should be our first step um, within this process. And so um, I'm supportive of not taking action today. Um, I'm supportive of, you know, supporting uh, education and outreach so that people are aware of these programs. Um, I, I guess I would like to ask Supervisor Friend, since uh, he's on the Monterey Bay Air Board, um, what kind of outreach or is the air board actually doing right now on this across the different counties? Because another thing is that, you know, given that our resources, if there's another agency that actually is funding this, you know, if they're already doing outreach, we can help support that effort rather than kind of, you know, reinventing the wheel and going off on our own. Um, and that'll actually help us save resources to go towards other things that we um, have prioritized as a county. And so I'm just curious if you may be able to speak to the outreach efforts at MBARD currently on this. It's an excellent question because the outreach efforts were sort of the largest part of discussion of the fact that MBARD had felt, and they've done their own media outreach. They've reached out to every local jurisdiction to do their own amplification. They've done their own social media. They've done bilingual work. Um, they've done monolingual work. They've they've worked with Univision and, and other. However, they still believe that that those that are disproportionately taking advantage of the program are not the targeted audience that we're talking about here. And so the reason I brought up the Day Workers Center a month ago on this, and I saw that it was reflected in today's report, is that I think every community is going to have their own trusted partners. And so I, I think that they were looking to us in my previous conversation with them to go ahead and do our own amplification as well. So I agree with you. They've done outreach and, and there's been a lot of money that's actually been drawn down from it. It's just not for the targeted group that we're specifically concerned about harming. Um, so I think we need to go out on our own. So what I would recommend is that we direct staff to work with these community partners to come back with community partners that may be a cost associated with that and to figure out what that is and then to come to the board with that may be or if it's an amount that's small enough that the CAO feels comfortable with authorizing we can also give the CAO that authorization because this isn't to create a massive cost but I think that we also want to make sure that we don't I mean harm a, an already impacted population in our community. Can I just ask the county council do we need to make a motion not to adopt this ordinance then today. I, yes, is you, you made an original motion that didn't get a second. So if you wanted to withdraw that motion, you could withdraw that motion and then a substitute motion would be uh, to made it. to not adopt the ordinance today and uh, make whatever uh, additional direction that you wanted to give to staff. Okay, I'll withdraw that motion. Uh, we'll make that, I don't know what exactly you wanna have. <clears throat> If we go, excuse me, want to, want to uh, have discussions with the Monterey Bay, how, 
Well, it's, 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 it sounds like it's not a tabling of the ordinance. It sounds like the, the, the direction is just we're not going to adopt the ordinance. And then at somebody, either a board member or staff, will bring this matter back to your board at a time uh, that they choose to bring it back. And we've heard the discussion that before, on or before something like this came back to the board, you would want to see an education plan and or a lot more education around the topic. Is that fair? And outreach, yeah. Okay. Education and outreach. I think that that's 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 accurate. However, I think that we need the direction to start that immediately. I think that that uh, Mr. Reed was looking for the empowerment to do it. So what I'll do is I'll move uh, that we not adopt the ordinance today, but that we direct the CAO's office um, to work with OR3 on an outreach and education plan and to come back to the board should um, the costs trigger should it reach a, a cost that, that it triggers that necessity, but obviously the CEO has the individual authority to make that co that uh, decision on his own. Second. All right. So is there any further discussion? Seeing none. Um, I think this is probably, you know, messed up forward for us today, given the new information that we have. You know, the board is very supportive of environmental protection and our efforts to protect our environment, but it, it definitely seems like that this path is going to be one where not only are we going to be protecting our environment, but we're also going to be ensuring that low-income people aren't negatively impacted by this and making sure that people are aware of the opportunity to, you know, turn in their gas power leaf blowers and get uh, some incentive without them being excluded from that um, should we have gone forward today. And so with that, um, there's a motion by Supervisor Friend, second by Supervisor Koenig, and I'll ask the clerk for a roll call vote. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Friend? Aye. Fernandez? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Cummings? Aye. That passes unanimously, and that will uh, bring us to the end of our regular session. I'd like to ask County Council if there's anything that will be reported out of closed session today. No. Okay, so with that, we will adjourn into closed session. Just want to thank everybody for attending our meeting, and we will see you in two weeks.